So, we are going this weekend to be looking at a tech, which is a, a term of Riggs and Godem. Uh, Riggs and Godem was the Tibetan yogi who revealed the, uh, the uh, Changte, the northern treasures, which was one of the early uh, large uh, treasures of uh, hidden treasure text. This uh, short, uh, so this, uh, the text is called Mitagyuku, which means uh, kind of an encouragement uh, or a reminder of impermanence or wake up to impermanence. Gyutkul means to uh, pull forward or wake up uh, one's own gyut, the, the stream of one's own experience. And we wake it up by being aware of the impermanence of everything around us, including ourselves. Impermanence means something is there and then it's going. It's not reliable. Our culture is based on capitalist commodity in which we focus on there being real things which can be exchanged. However, the, even in this exchange system, the relative value of different commodities uh, alters according to market forces with the pressures on the world economy, the value of gold is going up. So this relativity of exchangeable value is uh, part and parcel of the, the world economic system. Also, how we can relate to other countries depends on ever shifting factors. At the beginning of the year, uh, Russian oil had a high uh, value, high valency. People thought, oh, this is wonderful, gas and oil. But now this uh, gas and oil becomes toxic for many countries because the money that the Russian state can get from the sale of gas and oil becomes uh, a resource for feeding the war in Ukraine. The more we look at the, the world around us, we see how unstable are the phenomena and our interpretations of the phenomena and our relationships with these phenomena. This world is unstable and unpredictable. And yet our ego self requires some degree of um, constancy in the uh, things that it relates to. We need some degree of stability in our health, some stability in the way in which we gain money. Now we have this uh, new system of uh, what they call in English zero hours contract, which means you get a job, but you don't know how many hours you're going to be able to work in a week. The fact that you have a job seems to give some sense of, oh yeah, this is what I do and this is how I can support myself, but the uncertain uh, number of hours that you will actually work in the week means you can never predict how much money you earn. So when we look around in ecology, in economics, in political uh, relationships, we find endless shifts in the complexity of interactions. And yet we have to hold ourselves together. I exist. I am me. I know who I am. I know what I like and what I don't like. In this way, we hold together or construct uh, a kind of continuous sense of ourself. But is it true that we know who we are? We tell ourselves the story of our identity. We link together the uh, factors of our existence into patterns. The patterns change, 
but we are able to reliably say, this is me, this is me. I am healthy, then I am sick. When I feel really sick, I don't feel at all the way I did when I was healthy. Yet somehow, because I can say that healthy or sick refers to I, to some enduring self-essence, it is as if in the midst of this turbulence there is stability. So this is a central theme in Buddhism. Is there a self? And if, if there is, what enduring qualities does it have? There are certain seeming components to our existence, our thoughts, feelings, sensations, the uh, shape that we have, the shape that the things around us have, the attribution as to whether they seem positive, neutral or negative for us, the particular way in which we perceive the uh, phenomena around us, the way in which we seem to believe that, yes, I see things the way they are. I see this car is red and that van is blue. And that redness or blueness of the vehicle seems to be something inherent in the car. But, but of course, when we... Uh, there, how we are perceiving, we see that red and blue are interpretations of what is occurring. In terms like uh, red and blue have uh, other connotations as well. Red is often linked with um, socialism or communism. It's linked with uh, blood. Blood can symbolize life, because if our blood stops flowing, we die, but it can also indicate death if the blood flows out of us. Now, you might say, oh, come on, but red is red. Red seems to be something real. But if you go to an art shop and you ask for some red uh, oil paint, they will show you many different tubes because there are different uh, tones of red. What is the true red? It doesn't exist. There are shadings of red that move towards orange with increasing yellow. The red also moves towards purple. So when we start to examine the nature of perception, we realize it's uh, less reliable than we would like it to be because the, we don't, we're not experiencing a pure perception, but one which is uh, merged in with different kinds of uh, concepts. Then we'll, we also have many um, ways of bringing the patterning of our sense of the experience uh, into foreground or background. If you go to work from Monday to Friday, then it's likely that uh, on a Saturday morning, time has a different uh, quality than on Monday to Friday mornings. It's not so important to align your embodied sense of time with the outer time of the clock and being at work and so on. So this uh, process of composition, of gathering uh, aspects of our experiential field into uh, patterns which are deemed significant or insignificant. This is an ongoing work. And of course, we are conscious to a certain degree about at least some of the factors that are in operation here. So I might think I'm conscious of the red car in the street outside my flat. There seems to be a simplicity in that uh, formulation. And yet shimmering beneath it is the dynamic nature of the factors which allow uh, the statement, uh, I'm conscious of the red car outside my flat, to be meaningful. That is to say, I, the language through which I express this sentence 
is constraining and directing how I phrase the sentence. I feel that I am speaking language, I'm speaking English, but English is speaking me. <clears throat> And I live in London, where we have many, many kinds of English. We have uh, Jamaican English, Australian English, and all the different tonal qualities of the various immigrant groups. All are recognizable as English. There is no true English. So each person will prefer the English that has more resonance for them according to their history, gender, economic status, and so on. Some people become very upset if uh, they hear other people using the wrong kind of grammar or vocabulary because then maybe their tilt is on uh, comprehension and uh, predict and uh, reliability of phrasing whereas someone else might be concerned with language as a playground in which uh, words can be uh, joined in unusual patterns this is going on all the time so then how will i speak well i, I have to speak the way i speak which will please some people and not other people also, I will speak in different ways with different people. Am I being more true to myself when I speak in a formal way in a work setting or when I speak in a more casual way if I'm hanging out with some friends? Because if my speech acts are relative to the situation, then my alignment, oh, sorry, my authenticity depends on my alignment to the particular situation. I'm not being authentic in the sense of true to myself because myself is a stream of possibilities. And this uh, rangu, this stream, like a mountain stream bubbling over different rocks, this stream of myself shifts and turns according to what it encounters. So the, the title of this uh, short text is uh, it's very important. It's an invitation not to solidify our sense of self, but to stay present with the diversity of our concrete specific manifestations moment by moment. The, what we take to be the outer environment is shifting and changing with the time of day, the seasons, whoever is wandering about, which birds are in, still in the country, which have left to go to warmer places. And our experience of sensation in the body and of our feelings and our thoughts, memories and plans, these are constantly shifting and turning to be aware of impermanence is to see the actual dynamic nature of experience. So, <clears throat> again, if I say, I see a red car in the street outside my flat, I am here, I exist, I am able to see, I can use language and describe what I see, and I tell you, there is a red car on the street outside my flat. Something has been established. A fact. I'm telling you the truth. So when we experience our life in these terms, we are massaging or injecting into the three concerns a sense of uh, truth and validity. So the three concerns or the three wheels are the subject, the object, and the connection between them. This connection is the verb. We attribute to the verb the, the doing bit, the active bit, 
and that allows us then to think that somehow the subject and the object are somewhat stable. And this supports our embeddedness in the dualistic structure of samsara. The subject is other than the object. Each is supported by its own existence. And these existences are mutually excluding. The subject is not the object. This uh, confirmation of the separate existence of myself is supported by the sense of the rejection of the factors of the other, of the, the trees, the birds, the people, and so on. So it's as if there are two clearly defined categories, self and not self. But if you feel it very loving towards someone, you might feel that they are not just part of your world, but part of yourself. When you go to the shops, you buy the things that they want to eat. So it's as if they are inside your mind and as part of the part of your own concern may they be happy but then the relationship gets more difficult you don't enjoy kissing them so much you don't want to cook for them in fact you don't want to see them now their irreducible otherness becomes visible once again so probably we've all had some experiences like this and we start to see that the boundary between self and other is clear in linguistic formation and conceptualization, but in actual lived experience, it's much more uncertain. So the more we see the impermanence and unpredictability and unreliability of our own personal experience, we can start to wake up from the dream of our assumptions. We have fallen asleep in the dream of reality. <clears throat> As many of us have looked again and again, the teachings point out that all phenomena are illusory. They appear, you can, you can have an experience, you see, you hear, you taste, you smell, you touch. And this can be interpreted, I am holding the teacup. But of course, teacup is an interpretation. The shape from the teacup can be used for many different things. <coughs> the experience is something which is situationally arising. I say the teacup is real, but experientially, for me, the teacup becomes more real when I want to drink tea and less real when it's on a shelf in the kitchen. The value, for me, of the teacup is relational. If uh, it's not a very expensive cup and I drop it and it breaks, well, that's some money which I have to uh, spend to replace it. But if it's the last uh, teacup that I have from those I inherited from my dead mother, then it has a different meaning. If you look at the teacup, you don't see the echo of my dead mother. But when I pick up the cup, I think, oh, yeah, mom, you, so many times together we drank tea. This value seems to be in the cup, but it's in my mind. It is the mind which, through its reification, its uh, solidification, its uh, attribution of inherent existence, it's through this that the seemingly inherent value and reality of the object is established. The cup is my mind. When we start to see this, then 
the fundamental duality of subject and object, inside and outside, valuable, not valuable, and so on, starts to thin and dissolve. So <clears throat> it's, uh, there are uh, five uh, verses to this uh, encouragement. I just go through the Tibetan of the, the first verse. Hearing the, the sound is uh, believed in the tradition to make a, a connection to the energetic quality of the text. We tend to be over fixated on the cognitive value of uh, what we hear or read. But the text itself is uh, energy, because all sound is energy. When we laugh, that's a different feeling from when we cry. If you hear a child crying, you, you stop You think, whoa, what's the matter? This is the energy of the sound. It touches you. And in the Tibetan tradition, the, the texts are always read out loud because it is in the sounding that the cognitive value, the, the uh, abstracted intellectual value, and the energetic life of what is being read arise together. So there are many tunes that it can be sung to, but that's uh, the basic rhythm. In each verse is beginning with the mantra of Padmasambhava. He has three main uh, mantras, uh, outer, inner, and secret. This is called the inner mantra, and it begins Om Ahum. Om calls into presence uh, the body of the Buddha, Ah uh, calls into presence the speech of the Buddha, and Hum calls into presence the mind of the Buddha. And uh, this uh, text is uh, kind of, uh, it's a tantric, uh, it has tantric aspects and Sokshin aspects. In, in, in Tantra, we, we move from being the audience to being the actors. When you're reading, uh, say, a Mahayana text like the Heart Sutra, you're reading this, an account of a dramatic encounter. Buddha Shakyamuni is uh, resting at this uh, vulture peak mountain in Rajgir in Bih modern Bihar in India. And um, in his, he's resting in meditation and uh, with the uh, blessing or power of that meditation, there starts to be a dialogue between the Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara and Shariputra, the, uh, if you like, the representative of the Theravadan tradition. So as we read this, we're aware of some uh, conversation, some transaction going on between the characters. We're reading, sorry, we're, we're reading about what happened a long time ago. But when we come into Tantra, we enter into the immediacy of the manifestation of what we're describing. That is the thing. So uh, we each have our ordinary identity. This is who we believe we are. And our family and friends and uh, workmates, they all believe, oh, yeah, that's who you are. But when you come into Tantra and you have a, an initiation into a deity, you are introduced to the idea that all the factors which seem to compose your daily identity are not inherent. They are like your clothes. 
the clothes that you wear on a particular day, they express something about your mood or the setting that you're operating in. But when you come home, you might take off your clothes and have a shower. The clothes are lying scattered. They wear you, they were part of your persona, part of how you were presenting yourself, but they are not intrinsic. So then you put on some other clothes. So the purpose of the tantric uh, practice is to uh, allow, introduce you to the naked quality of your own mind. And that the energy of this mind manifests in terms of body and speech. And that these three aspects of body, speech, and mind have a manifesting aspect which is inseparable from emptiness. This apparitional quality, like a, like a dream formation, shows in the particular patterning of the deity of the initiation. You might look like a 16-year-old girl or an eight-year-old boy, like some forms of Padmasambhava practice. Very peaceful, reassuring, smiling face like uh, Avilokiteshvara. Or a very uh, dominating and uh, fear-instilling form like uh, Dorji Trollo. None of these forms are real. We want things to be real. But the desire for things to be real is our ignorance and stupidity. A goddess like Tara is not real. This doesn't mean, this, this doesn't mean she's a, a fantasy, like some Hollywood fantasy. But she is form that is shape, you can see, color, and so on, and emptiness. So the mind itself is empty, but the energy of the mind shows itself as sound and light. In this, it, according to the practice, becomes yourself as Tara. This then becomes your uh, true identity. In Tibetan, it's called a yidam. This is what binds your mind, your yid, to your true identity. Then, as you move in the world with other people, because you are at peace or grounded in the sense, I am Padmasambhava or I am Tara, how you relate to other people depends on the situation. Your true uh, identity or your true site of manifesting is an ungraspable deity. And this remains the ongoing truth of, this is me. And due to conditions, you speak in different ways with people, your, your posture, your gestures change as you relate to them. This flexible responsivity is arising as the potential of your true identity. Thus, my ongoing reference point is I am Padmasambhava. And if you annoy me, I might appear angry. Padmasambhava also shows an angry face. Tara shows an angry face as well. So, if anger arises, independent origination because of something you say to me, and I catch the arising angry response coming through, then I can see, oh, there is no I that is angry, but there is anger. And anger is a mode of the energy of the unborn open mind. And in this way, identification with the deity prevents the collapse into 
these uh, three wheels of subject, object, and uh, connective uh, activity. And we're not thinking about this. We are bringing ourselves into the immediacy of this uh, presence. Now, just as uh, in the theater, actors rehearse so that they are able to manifest a spontaneity in the performance. So in the tantric tradition, we do a lot of recitations of mantras, millions of recitations. This is a way of allowing ourselves to be permeated by the energy of the particular practice so that it goes from our skin through our flesh into the very marrow of our bones. So that it's not me pretending to be Padmasambhava, but it's Padmasambhava manifesting different forms of James according to circumstances. This is the essential transformation which is at the heart of Tantra. Then the, in the next part of the mantra is Mahaguru. Maha means big, and there is nothing bigger than emptiness. Everything is inseparable from emptiness. You can't catch emptiness. It's not a thing. Thinking about it won't bring it closer. We awaken to emptiness when we see the ungraspability of all experience. Just now you're listening to speech. Sound is coming into you and dissolving. This is what sound does. It is a impactful patterning of energy which vanishes. The same with our body, our facial expression, our breathing, our posture, our gesture, these are shifting according to circumstances. They don't reveal me, they reveal the potential of the mind. Guru means a teacher. In particular, it means a teacher who links you to your own true nature. And you can't be connected with your true nature unless that is vital and alive inside you. It's not something that you need to make. This uh, Buddha nature is intrinsic. It is the, the ground of your being. So at the beginning of the mantra, the Om Ah Hum, this, the, the mind, uh, the body, speech, and mind of the Buddha is your body, speech, and mind. And you are the guru. Now, your ego self is not the guru. The ego self is the anti-Buddha. As long as you remain in that nexus of interpretation, you won't be able to awaken to the truth of your presence. But the one who awakens is Buddha. As it shines forth, its light removes all obscuration, and in that moment, it is the guru. So we have the outer guru, the various teachers we might meet and get teachings and blessings and initiations and so on. But the inner guru is the primordial Buddha nature, which is the profound source of light. The function of the guru is to help you to see your own light. It is the emptiness, the ungraspability, and yet the immediate presence of your own body, voice, and mind, which is the energy of the great guru. Okay, let's uh, take a break here, and we'll come back and go through the rest of the mantra and into the verse. So if we can come back at quarter two. Good. See you then. Okay, I think it's about time. So 
<clears throat> with regard to the the mantra, uh, as I say, the great guru is also the outer guru, and it says in many many texts and teachings that devotion to the guru is very important. This is because the people that we meet in the shops and at work and in the family are wanting to confirm that their sense of who we are is correct. The usual transaction in samsara is, I am real and you are real and we will validate each other's reality. And the guru should not be doing that. The guru is someone who can see that in the moment of our manifestation, we are the manifestation of the ground potential and not of the ego self. In, the, in various ways, trying to say, don't get so identified with your clothes. In this life, you have a male or female body. In another life, it will be the opposite one or as an animal, or in a god realm, a hell realm. That is, that is to say, you are not fundamentally or essentially a human being. You are not fundamentally German or Spanish or Polish. Due to causes and conditions, these relative identifications uh, become the factors of our composition for a while. It is a great gift when people attend to our illusory nature. If my sense of my reality is based on you also being real, then if you wake up to the illusory nature of your identity, it is as if that is an attack on me. This is why the Sangha or the group of practitioners is important. Because hopefully we can interact with people who are also concerned with waking up. Anyone who doesn't take our existence seriously is actually a friend. Unfortunately, of course, in samsara, uh, the people most likely not to take our existence seriously are <coughs> rather dangerous people. The indigenous people who are pushed out of their forests and jungles, the inhabitants of countries which are invaded by other countries, the lives and existence of these people is not taken seriously by the invader, but this is not the path to liberation. Because we have these two polarities, existence and non-existence. The persecuting invader says, you think you exist, but I can kill you. For me, your non-existence is fine. I don't care. But the Mahayana understanding of illusion is the middle way between all these extremes. People are neither uh, truly existing or non-existent. They are appearance and emptiness. When we see the emptiness of people, we maintain the pathway of wisdom. And when we attend to the appearance of people, we maintain the pathway of compassion. And so we need to keep these two pathways or aspects together, collaborating. They're often compared to being like the two wings of a bird. They need to be uh, kept together and uh, in harmony. So when we do our meditation practice and we become aware of the illusory nature of our own presence, then this clarity is the, is the, is the function of the inner guru. Then the mantra continues, Sarva Siddhi Hung. Sarva means all. All means as required. Siddhi is the 
power of connectivity, the, <clears throat> the power of non-duality. We are always already connected with everything which is occurring. Every uh, plant that arises, every person, every animal is an aspect of our experience. In so this, all the cities means all the powers, all the capacity to relate to whatever is occurring. That is to say, a city is not something that you get and hang on to. It is a form of performativity, of uh, display and connectivity. And then at the end of the mantra is Hung. And Hung uh, activates the mantra. Hung is the site of the... Uh, non-duality of the five poisons and the five wisdoms. So you can mobilize the diverse uh, energies which you already access, but with the insight into their empty nature. So for example, if you get angry, you can be swept into the strong force of the anger. And that arises because you, as an ego self, have been impacted by something. But if you are resting inside the identification with the deity, so that your mind is the, the Dharmakaya, the mind of all the Buddhas, your speech is Sambhogakaya, which is the, um, the immediate... Uh, translucent, transparent presence of all the deities, and your body is the Nimanakaya, the apparitional, or illusory formations which arise with circumstances. So, these, when we say Oma Hung at the beginning, we are evoking that is our positioning and therefore, our response to any provocation is the energy of the five poisons, but with the reification taken out so that they display as the five wisdoms. So the most general basic form of practice is, uh, is shamatha or shine, which indicates to uh, be calm. When we are calm, we don't react so quickly. Samsaric interactions are often very, very quick. So as the mind calms and you see the groundless ground of your own presence, then there is space whereby you can respond if required without being pulled into dualistic reactivity. So in the tantric system, the purification of anger is called the mirror-like wisdom. Now, if you imagine a mirror, if you put something disgusting in front of it, it simply shows that. It, the mirror doesn't want to punch you for putting this horrible image in front, which is now reflected inside it. So in that way, when the mind is able to see the actual situation, what is to be done? Maybe something, maybe nothing. Because this provocation is not getting to me. The provocation is being revealed in the spacious clarity of awareness, which is like the mirror. So if you tell me that you don't like me, that's you saying something about you. Okay, thank you for telling me. But if I want you to like me and you say, James, I don't like you, then I hear your words as an attack on me. And I feel hurt and maybe angry too. The difference between samsara and nirvana is only in 
the nature of the experiencer. The experiencer of samsara is the individual ego self, which is vulnerable and uncertain. The ego self is a, is a construct. It has no inherent truth of its own. So when we come to the end of the mantra and we say, Hum, this is a kind of, again, a wake-up call, a reminder, relax and open. So in the first, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in the first line of this first verse, it says, Jigten Nangwa Gyuma Gola Kang. Okay, so Jigten means the world. Jig means to, uh, to break or to fall apart or be destroyed, and Ten means the place. Or the, so the, the Ten the, 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 is the, the site of falling apart. This is where everything is unsustainable, which we see with climate change, wars, and so on. The environments that we're keeping, <clears throat> many different kinds of insects and birds and so on, alive and flourishing, are no longer present. And so these species fade out. So this is just another way of talking of impermanence. Whatever you make in your life, whatever you build up and achieve will fall apart. That's why it's uh, useful to go to graveyards. You see, oh, these people were once living and laughing and eating, and now they're gone. Now they're gone. We see buildings which were once strong, now collapsing. Things fall apart. This is not uh, an accident, and it's not a punishment. It's how it is. It is a delusion to imagine that we are living in a world where uh, stable situations can be established by our own wishes. Then it says uh, nangwa. Nangwa means, uh, it can mean light, something you see, uh, an appearance. The appearances of the world for us are mixed. They are appearance through the senses merged with our ideas about what we are seeing. They are deluded appearances. The mind's nature itself gives rise to pure appearance where the experience of the senses arises and passes, Thoughts, feelings, memories arise and pass as empty phenomena. They, they can't be built up into something solid. Nothing plus nothing plus nothing is nothing. But when you believe that you see real cars and houses and people, this mentally fabricated reality seems to step out of nothing into one. Then one and one is two, plus one is three, and so on, building up these uh, composite images. So these worldly appearances, which seem separate and substantial with their own individual existence, they are actually illusory like the mirage on the summer road, like the reflection of the full moon on a pond. It appears to be there, and yet it's not there. And it says, Gola Kyan, means I know this. I've studied this. And uh, Rig Zingodem, who wrote this, he could teach it from morning to night. And he knew it back to front. But then at the end of the line is Kyang. But towards these true nang, these bewildering appearances. And for the ego, they're not bewildering. Because the ego is committed to stupidity. It's only when you come into Dharma and you, you start to understand, oh, this is an illusion. But I keep believing it's real. 
these appearances are bewildering me. But this is not true. The appearances are not bewildering. Sorry, we are bewildered by what we do with the appearance. We want it to be something that it is not. We want the world to be full of real things and real people because we also want to believe that we are real. So he says, yeah, towards these appearances, up until now, Dag Zinke, I grasp uh, or grasping at the seeming reality of these phenomena still arises in my mind. So oh, Dag indicates a, a self or an inherent existence, a somethingness, and we believe in this. The zinpa means to hold or to grasp, but when we grasp something with our mind, we, our mind merges in it. We, we believe it's true. That's how we apprehend the things in the world. In the last word in the line is ke, means to arise or to manifest or be born. The sense that objects truly exist is itself not self-existing. It is something which arises. So this is very, very important for us. It means that samsara is not like a prison. Samsara is much more like an addiction. For the person who is smoking cigarettes, each cigarette is a new aspect of the identity of being a smoker. We can say, oh, that person smokes 40 cigarettes a day. They're, they are a real smoker. But in fact, they are doing smoking 40 times a day. And this is the nature of this previous term, dagsin, of believing in a self. So I'm smoking a cigarette. I have to take the cigarette out of the packet. I put it in my mouth. I light a match. I bring the match to the cigarette. I suck in so that the fire is pulled into the burning end of the cigarette and then I'm inhaling the smoke. And now, of course, I have to blow the smoke out again. And then I have to suck it in again. Clearly, smoking is an activity. But out of this dynamic, ever-moving activity, I manage by a perverse alchemy manufacture a fixed identity, I am a smoker. And because I am a smoker, I need to remember to buy more cigarettes. So here we see the, the term uh, that was at the beginning of the line, true nung, the, the deluding appearance is the mental formation of I am a smoker, and the presence of entities, cigarettes, which for me are desirable. There is no <clears throat> essential reason for extracting this seeming doer of the deed or essence of smoker from the activity of smoking. So if we see this, this is the door to liberation because I am imprisoned inside my beliefs about who I am, how the world is, how other people are. I take myself and others to be identifiable, knowable entities. And this is the mental obscuration or the opacity of the mind that does not clearly see everything is movement. When we see that these thoughts or impulses or tendencies arise in the mind and vanish, then we see 
arising and passing, arising and passing. <clears throat> Just as if you have a, a, a mala, a set of beads for counting mantras, you need to have the, the thread to hold them together, otherwise they scatter. So we have moments of experience. And they're there and gone, there and gone. But the thread on which we string them is our belief in the existence of separate entities. So next week I will go to Poland. I will arrive in this airport I've been in before. I'll be back in the same place. It will be the same because I can call it the Chopin Airport. So, is this the Chopin Airport? Yes. Okay, I've been here before. This airport is an enduring entity. This knowledge, uh, this uh, knowing what to do in the airport allows me to be competent in my life as an adult person. That seems quite quite good. That's intelligent. It's a kind of intelligent that allows me to rely on the name rather than looking at the phenomena. So unless uh, some wicked witch has put a spell on the people in the airport and they are all frozen in exactly the same position as they were the last time I was in the airport three years ago. And I will arrive like Prince Charming and kiss them and they will wake up like Sleeping Beauty. This will be a new airport. Different people, different movements around, probably repainted in different areas. And I will be arriving after Brexit. I still have the same nose, the ears, and so on. But I'm no longer in the EU. So for me, going through the passport is a different experience. They put a stamp in the passport. They didn't do that before. So in that way, if you attend to the phenomena, they are always fresh. It is the patina, the, the veneer of concepts which generates the delusion that there are stable things out there. So if I get out of the plane and go up the little tunnel and into the main hall, <clears throat> and I think, oh, this is, yeah, this is the airport. That is a thought. This is the airport. It takes three seconds to have that thought. And it's gone. It seems to be pointing to something real. It plugs into the general belief independent, autonomous entities exist. So the pattern of unawareness of not being aware of the open ground which is inclusive of everything from which the pattern of identification of seemingly real entities has arisen then this quickly arising and passing thought oh it's the same airport this thought is among friends because we we have been trained in school to have thoughts about something. We study history about times we cannot go to and geography about places we will never visit. Knowledge is about something. It is mediated. Awareness is direct, unmediated. So this is the key difference. If we stay present, we are aware, I am talking, I am walking, I am eating. And the more we stay present, the more we see, when I say I am talking, 
we become aware that talking is something proceeding by itself and onto which I attach the label I am. That is to say, I am present as the space within which talking is occurring. The mirror shows reflections. There is no factory inside the mirror making reflections. The reflections arise situationally. The mirror has the potential to show the reflections according to circumstance. In the same way, each of us has a mind, and the mind has the potential, the energy, to show different forms according to circumstances. I am aware of talking coming through what I call me. So, when an experience arises, what is the ground of that experience? On, on a relative level, the ground is my own habit formations. But when I observe myself in the moment of speaking, I find that I am saying this. I wasn't there, as it were, before I spoke, thinking, what will I say? The speaking manifests and is revealed through me, to me, as me. So our experience is always dynamic. Although the patterns of concepts that we use can quickly generate a density in which it appears that there is a doer of the deed. So in the next line, he's saying, uh, Nyomo, these... Uh, poisons that I have, which are part of my way of being, they are troublesome and obscuring. So when we are full of desire or anger or jealousy, uh, there is a, a kind of constriction in our availability. It is as if our open presence is conditioned by these factors and uh, it is then as if they are who, who we are. All of these uh, afflictions have the quality of being pervasive. We are suffused by them. In the way if you put some boiling water in a cup and put in a, a tea bag, the, the color will spread out through the water desire, aversion, jealousy, pride, they, they fill us up. They become our color, our coloration, our flavor. And this is because the ego self is absorbent. The ego self, although it wants to be uh, autonomous and omnipotent, is part of the whole has no independent uh, reality and is dependent on interaction for its existence. Just as our body needs to breathe in and out, so through the senses, the mind is receiving uh, experiences of the world mediated through our mental consciousness, which reifies the experience. And this is then uh, further intensified by the consciousness of the afflictions, which uh, brings these uh, flavors into them, into the moment. This, is, this indicates to us that our ego self is hollow. It's empty, but in the sense of an empty bucket, not of open Buddhist understanding of emptiness. So it's always trying to get some new experience or some content out of the current moment of the field of experience. So in the Dzogchen tradition, when talking about awareness, 
which is unborn and always open, one of its uh, aspects or qualities is described as being dangwa or a kind of translucency. So in the traditional example, if you take a, a crystal ball and you put it on some red cloth, it will look a little bit red. And then you put it on blue cloth, it will look a little bit blue. So you could say that the color of the cloth seems to spread through the crystal ball. And then when you take it off the cloth, the color is immediately gone. So that's awareness. It's non-dual. It has no border guards. Everything is allowed to come, but there is no stickiness, no absorbency. But with the ego self, it's different. <clears throat> because when I become suffused with one of the five poisons, <clears throat> and then I, the anger vanishes or disperses, I still have the next term, bakcha, which means subtle traces. In the traditional example, if you put a, a musk pod from the musk deer into a box and leave it for a, a day and then take it out, the empty box will still smell of musk. So these subtle traces predispose us to further experiences of hungry merging with experience. So I'm, I'm not finished. Then it says matongwa. I'm not finished with these patterns. They are still operating in me. I, I'm not in the moment of their arising. I am not a relaxed, open presence that allows them to come and go. I find myself as the subject who is experiencing the anger or desire. And it is this fusion of subject and object which maintains the basis for the recurrence of these experiences. Now, coming to the last line of the verse, uh, <clears throat> it says, Chak Shen means desire and uh, hope or longing. This is a kind of basic neediness. This is the quality of the ego self. I am not complete in myself. I need these things to make me feel like me. So the, this is the, the vulnerability of the ego self, which is a delusion. And because it's a delusion, it has to reinvent itself again and again. And that's the, the hunger of the ego. So we can read the last words of this line in two different ways. One is to say, please bless me by cutting the root of all hopes and desires. Because tsedne uh, means from the root. You want to extirpate, take this out from its very root, which is unawareness. And then it says, Chinji Lo, bless me. So you can recite this, praying to Padmasambhava, please do this for me. You are the great, big, strong one. Free me from this uh, limitation, which is destroying my potential. But... Uh, <clears throat> we can also read it from a more uh, Zokshen point of view, because this verb chirpa means uh, it's cut. So then it says, if you like, bless me so that I wake up to the fact that the root of desire and hope or attachment is already cut. It is already cut because samsara has no root of its own all phenomena in samsara are empty it's not that samsara exists and we have to uh, get out of it and go somewhere different but because when we see that everything is arising that this is dynamic experience what could we grasp 
even the concepts which seem to establish something definite, they are directly without any existence. So when I think, ah, I've been in this airport before, it's arising and passing. It's a thought which doesn't establish anything as an objective fact. It is an ephemeral experience within the ceaseless surge and flow of the ocean of ephemeral experience. Samsara has no root. The root of samsara is belief that samsara exists. We believe in Mickey Mouse, which is very useful if you have invested money in um, this factories where they make the plastic forms and the films of Mickey Mouse. There are Disney worlds in Europe and in America. Because Mickey Mouse is really a Nirmanakai of the Buddha, he can manifest many different forms in different places. And if you go into Disney World, Mickey Mouse is smiling and waving his big hand at you. Small children find it easy to believe in Mickey Mouse. Big people are thinking, how much money am I spending to look at plastic? We are like this. The Buddha says, ah, this is plastic. This is ersatz. This is not, uh, it's not what you think it is. If you observe how samsara is arising for you, you, f you will see directly it has no substance, no reality, no inherent existence. You will see it has no root, no basis as a substance. But if you believe it to be real, it will be real for you. So belief is a confusing mediation of experience. Awareness is free of all mediation. It is direct. So now we have a break for lunch. So there's a, a chance to stay present moment by moment with whatever you do and observe the dynamic unfolding of these waves of experience. Okay, so we meet back on the hour in an hour. Okay. Bye for now. But there's still a lot left on the plate. Oh, I thought I was more hungry than I am. When we see this, then we have to, we, we have to see, I cannot trust what is arising in my mind. Because what feels really true is only true according to causes and conditions, to circumstances. How can I get free? So he says, uh, I awaken to the self-eradication of desire and craving. This means awareness, which is open like the sky, is not a ground that you can plant the roots of desires and habits and so on into. The desire, which is felt by the grasper, the subject, and the object, the desirable object, they are born together. They're like two babies born joined at the hip. You don't have a subject without an object. You don't have an object without a subject. They are born together. So the subject trying to get rid of this bad or dangerous object is not going to be successful because the subject and object are born together. Awareness is neither the subject nor the object. But the subject and the object are movements of energy between, uh, within the open spaciousness of awareness. And as we've been looking, each moment of our experience is very fleeting. In its fleetingness, it is fresh. 
So when we see these um, paintings of Padmasambhava, often his eyes are very big. He looks kind of surprised. Wow. Wow. <laughs> because it's fresh. He's not building up a picture of something. He's there with the freshness of each moment. And within that, nothing is blocked. Whatever comes, comes. But all that comes, goes. Experience is self-arising and self-vanishing. If we really hear this, experience is self-arising and self-vanishing. Okay. If this is true, then I'm not doing it. I'm not outside this flow of life making it happen. I'm moving inside the flow of experience. I, me, myself, is the movement of the mind. It's not these positions or namings are not describing a separate territory, but they indicate the site of different formations arising with circumstances. So if we say there is no self, that would be extreme because this body has a clarity of this is happening to me. But if you are awake, this is happening, and I describe it as to me. There is no me that it is happening to. To me is a way of indicating the site of the experience, but not the subject nor the object of the experience. Experience itself is arising as you and me, but it is free of you and me. So in the ocean, you have waves. And when you look, you see, oh, here is the crest of a wave. And next to it is this uh, falling part. The dip and the crest chase each other endlessly. Both are the ocean. They have no separate identity of their own. Similarly, all the experiences we have of self and other, you make me happy, you make me sad, all of these movements is simply the energy of the mind swirling in the space of awareness. If we stay with the presenting moment, it is dynamic. If we think about the moment and conceptualize a frame for it, then it will appear abstracted from time and appear to be self-existing. So when we have a desire, I desire an ice cream. In order to enjoy the ice cream, I have to destroy it. If I simply look at it in the sunshine, it will melt all over my hand. It is through my participation in the destruction of the ice cream that I enjoy the, the ice cream. When we have this kind of experience, you see, oh, my participation alters the object. The first time I met you, I knew I would love you forever. I saw you talking with your friends and you were so relaxed and laughing. But now that we are together, you're not laughing so much. You with me is somehow not as good as you over there. The woman I love, I can't have. Because the woman I have, the woman I get, somehow I don't seem to love her so much. This is the dynamic, interactive nature of our existence. The field around us is ever-shifting patterns of color, sound. And what we call ourselves is ever-shifting patterns of sensation, feeling, memory, thought, and so on. 
So movement is moving with movement within the big field of movement. The object of my desire is a movement of my mind. And the movement of my mind is ungraspable. So this is the cutting of the root of desire or the self-eradication of desire. If I don't keep investing it with uh, a pseudo life, the life of my idea about it, it will vanish. It's as if we are living in a zombie movie where the dead refuse to die and uh, they become quite problematic. Oh, uh, Rigsa Godem is saying, when it's gone, it's gone. When you, when you desire and you crave for something from the past or something which is not here, you're in a mental world. And when it comes to be here, the actual present presenting of phenomena, it is what it is and it's not what I thought. Some years ago, I went on holiday into Tarifa in the south of Spain, and lying on the beach, and the wind starts to blow. And without going to a beauty parlor, I got a gentle exfoliation as the sand was going all over me. This was not the, the quiet beach I had imagined. Because this is impermanence, all phenomena are changing their form. And then the key question is, how shall I inhabit this actual moment? It's not what I thought it would be. It's not even what I wanted it to be. But it is what it is. And this is it. This is all there is. So how to give myself to this? So, in, the, in our practice of Sokshen, we, we, we want to make sure we don't approach life with a big shopping list and a big plan. Because then we are preoccupied. We are already filled with ideas. And there's not so much space just to receive and respond to how it is. But if we can stay with this openness of the mind, then desire, craving, aversion, jealousy, they go free by themselves. In the Tibetan culture, they, they have a notion of your share. Share, your share. What is your portion? Let's say rancha means like your karmic share or your share in the family. You, this is your bit. This is uh, very helpful if you can see in life what is what is yours, what what doors open for you and what doors close for you. Then this is the circumstances of your life. As uh, Namkai Norbo said, you have to work with the circumstances. You can't trade them in for someone else's circumstances. So how do we bring our potential of creativity and plasticity and resilience into play with the contouring of our life as it manifests. And mainly we, we do this by relaxing and releasing ourselves from our fixed patterns of hopes and desires so that there is space for this fresh moment to show itself. So... <clears throat> Generally, we do this uh, through the simple Guru Yoga of the White R. Letter R represents emptiness, the unformed basis of everything. And we imagine a white letter R in the space in front of us, surrounded by rays of rainbow-colored light, which represent the the potential of the clear light coming from the sun of awareness. And we make the sound of ah three times. We're releasing ourselves from all the uh, preoccupations with sensation in the body, with memories of the past, plans for tomorrow, 
all the various clutter which seems to fill the space of our presence. And then with the ending of the, the sound of the third R, ah, we let the eye ah in front of us dissolve and we just rest in this open spaciousness. The surface of the earth is uh, allocated as something uh, owned by different countries and different corporations. And you can make borders between countries and put up barbed wire fences and so on. But, but very difficult to do this in space. Space itself has no top or bottom, no sides. You can't fix a point on it and then take uh, it to another point. People try to do this, but it's simply uh, their own mind that they are mapping. They're not mapping actual space. So in the same way, when we relax and release into this space, it is unowned territory. It's not even a territory. It's just unopened expand, unowned expanse. So we sit like this, open and relaxed. But sooner or later, the colonialists arrive. The, the ego arrives and says, oh, my mind. We want this kind of resident, but not these ones. Kick them out. My territory. Whenever this arises, and we're into judging good, bad, right, wrong, don't try to change this pattern of interpretation. Just remain present and open and allow these patterns of activity to arise and pass. The colonizing ego requires belief in it and identification with it to gain power. It has no power of its own. Okay. Uh, it requires our belief in it and identification with it in order to gain force because it has no power of its own. Okay, so we do the practice together a little. <clears throat> ah. Oh, this is uh, very simple, but also very deep. If you're new to doing the practice, you often find that there, there are some kind of commentary thoughts that arise in the mind. What am I doing? Am I doing it right? Nothing seems to be happening. My mind's getting worse. It's more disturbed. It's all very chaotic. Many of these thoughts arise because we have a long, long history of trying to impose order and structure onto experience. As we looked earlier, this has uh, two functions. One is it gives shape to the world. I say this is a house, this is a tree, and so on. But it also gives shape to the shape giver. When I say this is a tree, there is a subtle... Um, feedback loop confirming that I am the one who knows this. Confirming the object confirms the subject. So in this practice, we are not confirming subject or object. Just like these little waves going up and down in the ocean, when the wind blows, the peaks and troughs get more uh, extreme. What does it mean? Turbulent. But what does, what for? What's it? What does it mean? It doesn't signify anything. It is 
meaningless. This doesn't mean that our life is meaningless. The meaning lies in the non-duality of experience and the open presence of awareness. And the experience, uh, okay, means uh, that awareness is always just here and it's open. So normally we establish meaning by thinking about something or making patterns of concepts. In the Buddhist uh, tradition, this is called relative truth. It means to say that these truths which are constructed appear to be true and function as true under certain circumstances. So I might say, I feel quite healthy uh, relative with my age. I don't feel as healthy as I did when I was 20 years of age. So when we have the short sentence, I feel healthy, it kind of floats in the sky like a cloud. It has no real context. But actually, if I don't sleep well at night, I don't feel so healthy. This is relative truth. But whatever patterns seem to be the case, they are dependent on the circumstances pinning them in place. But the Mahayana tradition is also talking about uh, absolute truth or infinite truth. That is, uh, what is it or is there anything which is true, simply true in and of itself? Mm -hmm. The ungraspable emptiness or openness of the field of experience, this is not made by anyone. This is, the, uh, this is what is illuminated by awareness. It is the space of possibilities. And like space, it can't be uh, turned into something. So the absolute truth is the ungraspable, indefinable ground of all possibilities. Anything we say about it will be false or relative. It is nothing, nothing to think about, nothing to catch hold of, nothing to possess. But it's not nothing at all because you have thoughts and feelings and you feel hungry or you need now to go to the toilet. Lots of emergencies occurring. If you like, the, the ground of everything is nothing. Everything is the radiance of nothing. Is not only nothing because there is experience. But this experience is not the experience of something because it is in itself empty. So in the Mahayana tradition, this is said to be the non-duality or inseparability of relative and absolute truth. So we want to walk the line, uh, the middle way between the potential polarities of absolute or relative between appearance and emptiness. So now we'll have a break. And in the break, probably you get up, you move around, you might make something to drink. And just try to be attentive to how your body is moving in relation to the layout of the kitchen, the shape of cups or the knife or whatever you're using. I am a potential, but I can't say how it will manifest because how it manifests, how I manifest, is relational to what else is around me. I am relationality. So that's a very sweet thing to observe. Because rather than trying to solidify it by saying, but what does it mean? Why do I do this? Its validity is in the self-validity of this moment. If a feeling and thought of, I want a coffee arises, then the body has to go towards the coffee. No amount of mantra will turn tea into coffee. So you find yourself in this pulsation of connectivity. 
Okay, so if we start again in half an hour at 10.2. See you then. Okay. So, hopefully you can see from these verses so far that they are concerned with the kind of uh, problems that we ourselves face. Rigsar Godem was a, a great uh, yogi and scholar, but he had problems. Everyone has problems. Can we leave the problems behind? Some kinds of problems, perhaps. But the problems which arise from being enmeshed in duality, don't vanish so easily. We can struggle with them, but it's uh, like two twins fighting and their, their lives are bound together. Because the central paradox is, when you see that everything which arises is devoid of, is without any inherent existence, it ceases to be problematic. It doesn't become nothing at all. It doesn't vanish forever. But when it arises, you see, oh, it's like a mirage. If I awaken to the fact it's illusion, like a mirage, I don't need to fall into it and I don't need to run away from it. So then he says uh, in the next verse, uh, Om Maha Maha Guru Sarvan Siddhi Hon Dusun Yom Sewe Tachem Bo Javi Lundem Mambo Zula Kyan Bonge Bache Wondu Shiche Sho Ling and Sene Chipara Chinji Lok. So again, so calling on the mantra to remind us that we have the basis of full enlightenment already with us. When it says body, speech, and mind, it's my body, speech, and mind, as it actually is, when not veiled with the uh, layers of interpretation and projection that I normally bring to my life. So when we say uh, actualize all accomplishments, it means that, sorry, on you go, it means that the always present potential for awakening can be, can be actualized quite easily. We don't actualize it directly, but we actualize it by putting ourselves in the way of it. If you have some seeds for flowers or vegetables, you can't just sort of make them sprout you have to put them where they get what they need. Maybe at first you put them on some damp tissue for, so that the first uh, sprouting can occur. And then you put them in earth where there is enough water and enough sunshine, but not too much. The potential is there. Nothing artificial is being done what they are doing is providing the harmonious uh, environment in which this manifestation can occur. So, in my experience uh, working with people in therapy and also in Dharma settings, uh, it's quite saddening how many people dislike themselves. They are sure that there is something wrong with themselves, that they are bad or unworthy, or perhaps damaged by things that have happened to them. From my point of view, from the Dharma, uh, this is a false understanding based on the idea that my thoughts tell me the truth about myself. What we need to do is just slightly tilt that uh, understanding and see that my thoughts about myself hide the truth of the actuality of myself from myself. So rather than judging ourselves or coming to a conclusion about ourselves, 
we need to spend more time just being with ourselves. So then he says that um, great methods for clearing away the uh, three poisonous afflictions have been taught by the Buddhas in many instructions. So the way it's expressed in Tibetan, it has both these meanings of, on a relative level, clearing away the dangerous uh, provocations of the, of the three poisons, but also methods to see clearly or to see the clarity which is the actual truth of these three poisons. No one is murdered in a horror movie. We see people being murdered and tortured. So you might want to cover your eyes because it's horrible. It's a horrible illusion. How can an illusion be horrible? Because we believe in it. We think, oh my God, it's happening. We know, oh, it's a cinema. This is not real. So in the same way, when we see that our mind is actually open and that everything which is arising and moving in it is simply here and gone, here and gone, then we can free ourselves of the agitation of hopes and fears. Good, good situations come and go and bad situations come and go. So you can try to replace the bad situations with good situations, but both are impermanent. Liberation doesn't depend on the quality of experience which is occurring, but in seeing the non-duality or inseparability or non-difference of the experiences which were, are occurring, in the ground openness which reveals them. Then we see the clarity of them. Looks bad, but isn't. Like with the mirage, looks like water, but it isn't. There's no need to rush towards the mirage to get water. When beautiful, happy making illusions arise, we can, sorry, we can open to them with the clarity that they will vanish when they vanish. And the key point there is not to use them as a basis for making plans about the future, but to be present and to taste it as it comes and as it goes. The, the main cause of suffering is grasping at the ungraspable. With some kinds of lizards, if you reach out to catch them, you grab their tail and they run away, leaving you holding the tail. So this is us. We've got minds full of tails. Life has run away and we are left holding the tail. Better not to grasp. But that's easy to say. So he says in the third line, Yet I helplessly fall under the power of the subtle karmic traces that are so difficult to abandon. Subtle traces don't come in through the front door. They don't ring the bell. So you have a choice to let them in or not. These subtle traces are already pervading our sense of who we are. And when they arise, they feel like us. You might suddenly remember someone and think, oh, I'd love to see them again. It's been five years. So if we just think, oh, I've changed quite a lot in five years. Probably they have changed too. So the person I miss is, let's say, John. John from five years ago. Five years ago, John is not available. I may or may like, or I may or may not like uh, present John, I don't know. But when I phrase it, I want to see him again, I'm setting myself up for disappointment. He is gone. Life is like this. So these subtle traces, memories, recollections, 
they're like ghosts that haunt us. Not only has the living, breathing John changed, but our memories are unreliable. The John I remember is the John I have constructed in my mind. So there is no way back. In Dharma, we are concerned with the actual, the immediate. In English, they say a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. In this Yes, good. <laughs> because the the contact is where we are most alive and connected. When we are in contact with someone, we have the optimal chance to make small adjustments to increase our true contact with them. We're getting here and now direct information from the expression in their face, how they're breathing, their posture, and so on. By receiving this immediacy of how they are in this moment, the freshness of their presentation, if we really let it in, will help to wash out the cobwebs of our remembrances of how we think they are we wake up to, oh, this is you. And this is a revelation. You are not a thing. What will I do with you? All I can do is try to stay open. And the quality of our contact may allow some deep conversation or going for a walk or could be anything, but it will arise through the meeting of these two. The key thing is to move with availability into the world. So when he's describing the, the power of these subtle karmic traces, these are thin veils which block our availability to the other and our capacity to receive the other. Now, if, <clears throat> if I am truly authentically staying open to the other, there is a, a subtle movement of leading and being led. One person speaks and we respond and they receive what we've said and they respond. And there's a pulsation of connectivity. But perhaps that uh, finely tuned quality of communication is not as uh, frequent in our lives as we would like. Very often conversations are a choreography of serial monologuing. And then we go close to each other, but passing like ships in the night. Because we are each traveling on the trajectory of our own karmic dispositions and interests and obsessions. So these subtle karmic traces are very important to attend to. Sometimes the, with, with the meditation, the, the main uh, advice is just relax and stay open and don't pay attention to whatever is occurring. And that is important. But it's also important sometimes just to pay a simple attention to how we get lost, how we seem to merge into some habitual idea or current anxiety. In ordinary language, we would say, I got lost. I lost myself in that feeling. Maybe my mind wasn't very open, but at least I was mindful. I was kind of, I am here, a little bit solid, but I am here. And then I was in this little riff of thought and feeling, and then I was out of it. So in that moment, we see that I had slipped into the availability of the ego, the empty ego wanting something to hold on to. It's not that I have made a mistake. It, it, this is a, a structural problem rather than a personal problem. Once unawareness of the open ground manifests, the mind the, the consciousness manifests in terms of the duality of subject and object. 
and the subject is always looking for the right kind of object in order to feel okay. So the subtle karmic trace is the feeling, oh, this is important. I need to follow this thought or, oh, I give myself to the feeling. It's not so much a conscious decision, but you find yourself in it. It's as if it just happens, but there is a, a predisposition, a pre-formation which is waiting there. So if we can recognize this in ourselves without entering into judgment, we can start to see the, the stickiness of the desire for existence. I am someone. I am empty appearance. I am awareness and emptiness, clarity and emptiness, appearance and emptiness. Sounds not so interesting. I exist. This is me. Hey, let me tell you about me. Now we can get to something quite solid. No, James, you awareness and emptiness. My God, how are we going to have an evening in the cafe if we just awareness and emptiness? Can we at least have awareness, emptiness and a bottle of wine? The ego always wants something to happen, something to be the case, even if it is uh, suffering or difficult. So again and again, most of us in the practice have to breathe out, relax, and come back to the middle way between existence and non-existence. And then we find that that middle way is not a kind of thin line between the polarities, but is in fact like a, an infinite point. Sometimes we call this a tigli. And because the tigli is like a ball, it has no corners, no sides. You can't say this is the top or the bottom. And it can be a tiny, tiny point or open and include everything. So when we have this sense, then whatever is arising is within the open hospitality of awareness. From this point of view, the radiance of the mind is very generous. Each moment of our life, there's a lot happening. Colors, shapes, sensations, and so on, coming and going. If we accept this transient display, it's quite satisfying in its diversity. But if we enter into a dualizing perception, say this bit is good and that bit's bad, I want more of the good and less of the bad, then you can feel for yourself what it's like to be in that position. Like if you were a child and you, you were taken to some other family's house to eat. And you say, Mom, I don't like this food. Your mom says, hey, they're not going to poison you. It's food. Just eat, eat it. At least eat some of it. No, I don't like it. Then we see... The, the anxiety in the child to get the familiar blocks its capacity to be grateful for what it's actually receiving. So it, the food was not poisonous. It's the reaction of the child that is imbued with the, the three poisons or the five poisons. The immediacy of phenomena is pure. It is our own interpretations which add these differential values. <clears throat> so that's the, the power of these subtle karmic traces. There's already a kind of twisted attitude. We're, we're not in an open-hearted welcome. So he says, uh, I awake to the self-eradication of bad actions. Oh, bad actions arise from the ego self. The ego self arises from unawareness of its own ground. When we, when we are not aware of our own open ground, we say, I exist. And because I exist, I like and I don't like. And then all the 
bad actions flow from that. So the self-eradication of the bad actions is means simply to rest in awareness. We cut the root of the bad actions, not by doing something, but by offering no sustenance to them. Our limited or intense habits have no energy of their own. They gain energy by our commitment to them that we want to steal or lie or cheat. The thought doesn't do anything. We do something with the thought. It is our availability to duality which binds us into this endless uh, toing and froing. So, you don't even need to think about previous lives or even your life up until the beginning of this year. Since the beginning of this year, how many thoughts have you had? Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of thoughts, feelings, sensations. And where are they now? Some of these thoughts pushed you to the right, some pushed you to the left. Some made you stand up, some made you sit down. So very powerful, so very important. And now, gone. Never coming back. See, oh, these thoughts and feelings, which just like puffs of wind blowing the clouds in the sky, they blow through the sky. They don't move the sky because the sky is still there, but they move the clouds. The patterning of myself is a cloud formation. And these karmic traits or tendencies or arousals, they're like puffs of wind. Sometimes the wind gathers small clouds into a big one, and sometimes it disperses a big one into small ones. So, am I the sky, or the wind, or the cloud? From the teachings of Sokshen, I am the sky. Moving in the sky is the wind and the cloud. Both are welcome. They do not fundamentally affect the sky. They are intimately within the sky, but the sky is empty of any substance which could be pushed by the wind. So if you think from the beginning of the year, these thoughts, feelings, sensations, and how they moved you around, hopes and fears, experience after experience, pattern after pattern, and yet the mind is still open. The mind itself, as pure awareness, is indestructible. But every pattern of thoughts, feelings, sensations will be altered and vanished. So the self-eradication of bad actions is to remain open whatever is happening. When we really see, I am not who I think I am, then when the patterns of my thinking or feeling or sensation are changed, presence is here. Ego self is altered by events. Awareness reveals events, yet is untouched by them. This is the fundamental principle of our practice and why we, we are not into making antidotes and constantly trying to adjust ourselves. So, then he says, Om Maa Hol Mahan Guru Sarva Siddhi Ho Chikyan Lankyan Deman Thapi Kyan Tamche Kipi Tsawa Nijin Do Nazu Guryan Dupi Saman Ro Ransen Charbu Charwa Chinji Lo So, here he's talking about the the movements in the field of our experience. Qi Kien. Kien is a kind of secondary cause. So, for example, a seed would be the primary cause, the gu, and then the sunshine and the water and the quality of the earth, these would be the secondary causes or the conditions. 
for the outer conditions that we find ourselves in, the world around us, uh, what the people are like. Every city that we're in has some streets that it's probably not very wise to walk down at nighttime. If you choose to do that, you increase the, the risk of being robbed because there is a, a mood or a, something in the air in these environments where crime is more likely than in other parts of the town. Then we have these uh, inner uh, secondary causes or conditions. So that would be the state of one's uh, attention to what's going on. So if you've been drinking a lot of alcohol, you're not so aware of what's going on around you. And then you have a suddenly occurring events that would be like you're a bit unstable on your feet and someone bumps into you and you turn to look at them. And while you're doing that, their colleague has his hand in your pocket and your wallet is gone. You weren't expecting it. It is as if it just happened, but it could only happen because these other factors were in operation. So you can also use this to look at the, how this uh, war in Ukraine has started. The outer cause was the uh, spreading of NATO and the relative uh, poverty of Russia, the general dualistic structure of winning and losing, because when there is a conflict, there's winning and losing. And the inner cause, the people in the center of power ruminating that they have been robbed, they have been cheated by NATO, we were once so big and powerful. And the regret and the rage that comes from it is cooking just below the surface. So this would be like putting a pan with milk in it on a low heat. The, heat, the, the milk is now warm and you just need to turn up the gas and it boils over the pan. So the suddenly occurring events, we're never quite sure what impact they're going to have. Sometimes we're tired and we overreact to situations. Or it could be... Uh, you get a new boss at work, they remind you of your dad, you didn't have an easy relationship with the dad, this makes you very sensitive to everything the boss says, so it's as if your nerve endings are growing out to the surface, and the boss says something and wah, you come out very strongly. It's important to analyze these things for yourself. And in particular, to avoid giving a moralistic reading. Oh, God, why did I shout at the boss? That was really stupid. What was I doing? This, this doesn't uh, illuminate anything. But if we see how the, the vectors of these three conditions operate together, then the illusory self suddenly erupts. When you blame yourself or someone else, you further strengthen the reified notion of duality. But as he says in the next line, all these situations arise from the root of belief in duality. For example, you go to the bad part of town because you hear that there's a very nice restaurant there. That restaurant is very good. I want to go there. This is duality. You need to eat. Yeah, but that one is special. That's an idea. That's a mental construction. If necessary, you can have a sandwich. Food is food. Ah, but that place is special. In that way, duality is driving the notion of hierarchy of objects or situations. And I've been working hard. Life is difficult. I deserve a good night out. Well, again, this is an internal dualistic dialogue. And that prepares us to leap into situations which are not so helpful. I th what he is saying here really is life is not secret. Life is self-revealing. 
if you pay attention, you will see how these structures function. How shall I behave? Well, look and see. So if you say, oh, I, am, I have a strong habit of thinking in dualistic terms, good, bad, hot, cold, right, wrong. I set up the polarities in opposition to each other with the law of exclusion. If it's hot, it's not cold. If it's tall, it's not short. And this gives such a strong definition to what is being considered. He is very tall. That is an enduring characteristic of that person. He is tall. What a person. Not for a giraffe. That's irrelevant. He is a person. And this uh, strong definition that I can trust my thoughts, I know how it is. This is, this is, this is how duality functions for us. But then in the next, the third line, he's saying, I now know this. You know, I've been doing practice for some time. I've been looking at my life. I see, oh, this is true. My, when I go into this dualistic thinking, everything becomes intense and dull. But the knowledge I have is on the intellectual. I spend time analyzing and thinking about situations. And this is not strong enough to free me from the power of Mara. If we remember the situation when the Buddha was getting enlightened under the Bodhi tree, some of the uh, Mara demons came to disturb him and took on the form of aggressive and threatening warriors with uh, spears and arrows. Others took on the form of uh, seduction in various ways, young girls, old women, all kinds of ways in which something might hook the erotic. But Siddhartha, on the point of becoming the Buddha, was just sitting. All of this is going on. I'm not deaf, dumb and blind. I, this is here, it's very close but it's nothing to do with me. Like a very, very calm lake with no waves because he was aware. He was not established in his dualistic consciousness trying to work out what is going on. He let go of that involving dualizing consciousness, recognizing that it is one of the many structures which arise in the open space of awareness. But if I don't indulge it, it will have no power. So the Buddha just sits and he calls the earth as his witness. And of course the earth, the base doesn't move. Many things happen on the earth, but it's just there. So, if we want to avoid being pulled into reactivity, it's not that we have to engage in building battlements and defenses, but rather that we let go of the tendencies towards involvement. The ego needs a lot. Awareness doesn't need anything. Why does it need nothing? because it has everything. Everything that occurs is the radiance of awareness. So although awareness is empty, it's also full. Just as the mirror is empty of self and full of reflections. So when we do this uh, three R, we really release and relax. There are many secondary kind of practices you can learn to reinforce releasing and relaxing. You can swim in the sea, you can go dancing, you can go into situations where you feel embarrassed or shy and not running away, but also not being heroic. Here I am, shy and anxious. Okay. Then you see, oh, it's not a limit. It's manifesting 
as it were, in me and as me, and yet it doesn't define me. And the more we see that no pattern of arising is the truth about how we are, then we can allow many more movements. So then he says, uh, I awake to the arising of my naked awareness. Means I'm not going to struggle to change the content of my mind. From the very beginning, our mind has been naked and open. Like the mirror is open and it's naked in the sense it's empty of self. It, there's no fixed content inside a mirror. The reason I can have so many experiences is because none of these experiences is definitive of me. So awareness arises in the sense like the, the sun arises in the morning, the dawn light spreads out through the sky. The darkness and the light are not enemies. Sometimes the mind is very dull and nothing is happening. Sometimes we're a bit manic, our body is agitated, and we have many, many rapid thoughts. Allow it, because it is. There's not much you can do. If your mind is like this, it's like this. But if you say, no, I don't want my mind to be like this, this is not right. What you do is you shrink yourself. I don't want to be contaminated by this. And that shrinking is how you come to inhabit the ego self. Awareness is like the sky. It opens. So the fundamental point is to see the emptiness of your mind. I am not a thing. Nobody will agree with you. People like to know who you are, how you are, what you are. If you don't sit in your box, then... God knows where you're going to be. I've got my eye on you. So every state and every ego structure has this uh, fascistic tendency. But in meditation, we leave all that behind. We simply open and allow whatever comes to come, whatever goes to go. That's exactly what Buddha Shakyamuni did on the night of his awakening. You're not the victim. You're not the master. You're simply open and present with what is arising. And by having such a openness to these many different flavors of experience, without effort, you have more capacity to respond to different situations when you get up from practice. So... Tomorrow we go on to the last verse, which is a little bit longer, and it's di dealing more directly with uh, how the mind truly is. So, oh, thank you for your uh, presence, your attention, and thanks to our translators. And see you in the morning. Okay, bye for now. Bye. Bye. Bye, James. Bye, bye. bye, bye. James. Bye, 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 Thank you. Bye, bye, bye. James. Thank you. Okay. So we had uh, five minutes of dependent origination, <laughs> working out how everything connects together. So... <clears throat> Yesterday, we were looking at the encouragement not to depend on impermanent forms. Instead, we should rely on our own awareness. In order to do this, we need to be able to distinguish between dualistic consciousness and non-dual awareness. In order to do this, we need to rely on the guru. The guru is your own intrinsic awareness. This can manifest uh, externally in the form of a teacher or someone like that. And that external form can awaken you to your own awareness. The external guru and your internal uh, capacity to work with the guru, these are forms of manifestation. 
the ground of these manifest forms of the guru is pure awareness. And that's why we rely on the guru yoga of the white R. So we can begin with a, a little sitting, reciting R together three times, opening to the image of white R, and then relaxing in the openness. Okay. <clears throat> so when we sit in the practice, uh, this sensation arising in my body tells me I am here. I exist as someone. This is happening to me. So every time that... Uh, interpretation arises, we have a subtle confirmation of a difference between self and other, and the sense that I, me, myself, is a continuing substratum for all my experience. It lacks its own inherent concept. It fills itself with something which becomes me the moment it enters that territory. Just as all around us at this moment there's air, in a sense it's nothing to do with us, it's just neutral. But as soon as we breathe in, some of that air is coming in to our lungs, and in that moment it becomes my air. And then I breathe out, I release my air into the air. And in that moment, self is taken out of the air. Then when I breathe in, this sense of I, my air, is invested into the next batch of air, which is filling my lungs. Interesting. Identity shifts and turns so quickly. Identity is unstable, but the ego says I must have some identity, and it doesn't matter what it is. It has to, the ego is to identify with a wide range of possible occurrences and to say this is me or this is mine, which is driving our experience of our life. My world is an interpreted world. And inside that system of interpretation, the most perverse interpretation is to say that my world is objectively there. My world is real and it's out there. As we looked yesterday, this blinds us to the fact that what we actually experience is experience itself. And this experience arises immediately it's not the conclusion of something. We can, of course, think about it, elaborate it, invest it with feelings and so on. But in its immediacy, in the moment, it is not done by anyone. It would be ridiculous to say it has nothing to do with me because this is my life, this is what's happening. On the other hand, it's not mine because I'm not making it. It is revealed to me 
And in that moment of revelation, it is as if it is me. So with our uh, familiar uh, image or metaphor, if we consider the mirror, the reflection is in the mirror. It's not the same as the mirror because the reflection will vanish. And yet, as long as that reflection is in the mirror, it is as if that is the showing of the mirror. That is how the mirror is in this moment. The reflection doesn't define the mirror. We could say it's a showing of the potential of the mirror, but it doesn't limit the potential of the mirror to show many other reflections. Since you woke up this morning, you've had so many different kinds of experience through your senses, through your memories, your plans, and so on. And these uh, experiences have been present and then gone. They are true in the moment, but non-definitive of a self. You feel hungry, then you eat, and then you don't feel hungry. When you are hungry, it, it was undeniable that you're hungry. But when you've eaten, if somebody offers you more food, you say, no thanks, I'm not hungry. So the intensity of the feeling of hunger is in no way definitive of the truth about you. That is to say, the hunger seems to be referring to me, but this me, this sense of my own existence, is not something which can sustain any specific situational definition. So this is very important for meditation. When thoughts, feelings, and sensations arise, they seem to indicate that there is a, a referent. There is something there which the thought is referring to. Say, for example, I feel cold. The cold is referring to me. But actually, it's just my back that feels a bit cold. My arms don't feel cold. Yet, I would say, I feel cold. If we can catch ourselves in the moment of speaking or thinking in this way, we realize how the formulations that we make about our experience have no true validity. So when we're sitting in the practice and we have the sense of being present as ourselves, it often feels as if this is a, a kind of voice of truth. It, it's obvious and undeniable, I'm here. I can feel my shoulders, I feel my legs, I'm here. Now, if I'm taking the feeling of my uh, shoulders and my legs to be indicative of my true existence, then I'm taking a sensation to be the flowering of this ongoing I, me, myself as some continuous existence. I exist, and sometimes I feel hot, sometimes I'm cold, sometimes I'm energetic, sometimes I'm tired. This is the, the, the site of our own unawareness. We are installing an interpretation, a conceptual interpretation, in the absence of direct awareness. Well, as we said, there's some sensation, I say it's in my shoulders. I have shoulders. I have a body. This is happening to me. Each of these statements is like a, a brick that you're placing one on top of another another to make this great wall. But we don't see that we are a, a builder because we take it for granted that there is solid ground. I exist. And on the basis of this 
true existence, these events occur. The Dharma teachings say the opposite. They say experiences arise. When you leave them alone, they arise and pass. But when this uh, false construction of I have enduring existence is present, this uh, is pulling in more and more thoughts to confirm my own existence. So unawareness is to take a construct as if to be something intrinsic. Outside my window there is a tree and in the tree there is a, a pigeon sitting in its nest. And the pavement is covered with little twigs because the pigeon is not a very good nest builder. It's a bit big and fat, and every time it moves, bits of the nest fall out, so it has to go and get more bits to make it up again. So this in indicates we have the same situation. I, ex Sorry, on you go. I exist, but so much of my energy is uh, dedicated to self-maintenance. I'm just here, but I need to eat and drink and have a shower and go to work and pay my taxes and 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 endless work to to make this self-existing form exist so in the this is called uh, ahamkara or atmakara means holding on to or grasping on to a self and we hold it by belief. It's not a thing, it is a construction which is held in place by the work of believing in it and using other thoughts and feelings and sensations to repair it. Samsara is busy. We, we revolve in samsara, or we can say it's like a wheel which is always turning. Whereas liberation or nirvana is described as peace. Because when we realize that the constructed is indeed constructed, we can stop constructing. As the texts say, if you wash a piece of coal every day for a year, it won't turn white. If you keep trying to improve yourself and develop yourself and work on yourself every day, this activity of self-construction will never make the self self-existing or intrinsic or inherent. So from this, we can understand that when we sit in the practice and we continue to be busy, <clears throat> we haven't released ourselves from the structuring of duality. The key point then is not to struggle, not to try harder, not to try to make it happen. You can <clears throat> relax into the out breath, but if you're still very uh, agitated, then you could go for a walk or have a shower or have a sleep and then do a little practice again. Awareness is intrinsic. So if we really hear what that means, it means it's there on the inside. It's already included. It's always already part of my presence. <clears throat> Awakening is not up to me doing something. Awakening appears when we do less. When you are clear that the, the basic ground that you arise from is infinite emptiness, and that appearance is arising in the manner of a dream, then you can be busy or not according to circumstances. But if we start from the point of, here I am, this is me, this is how I am, <coughs> then we are already <coughs> embedded in the field of duality. 
So this is what he is going to, uh, Riggs and Godem is going to uh, unpack for us in the next uh, and final verse. So he says, Uma ahoy sarvag siddhi mahanguru sarva siddhi hoy nijin drole drova chinjilo e che pas me ran le le pala ke ke ale pe ran ze ma che shi chinte yang we sora ma chimba tradara o sarve bandi chinye yambe madam butrene le lo kinge ruchi ma tombarele Pe kambo che pe niacce te nyurdu chunyi madam butrene chinche drodon to chen che parasho chanchu sembe che pan che parasho jendong geve la chen du parasho korwa donne trupen tuto sho So in the first line he says um I awake to freedom from the fetter of belief in duality. This is uh, the beginning. We can also read it in the more uh, tantric way. Please bless me by freeing me from the belief in duality. When we uh, read it in that more tantric way, we're starting from the position that I am trapped by the belief in duality. And I need your blessing to free me from that. But from the very beginning, the mind has been free. The fetter of the belief in duality is just a belief. It's a delusion. We are intoxicated as a result of unawareness. Like a person who is very drunk or who has taken a a strong a drug like heroin or LSD, we don't see very clearly. The belief in duality is the kind of self-balancing attempt that arises in the mind with ignorance. So in the teachings of Dzogchen, there are two main aspects. Uh, there is primordial purity and uh, instant presence or uh, self-arising clarity. Primordial purity means that from the very beginning, there has never been even one atom of existence. That doesn't mean that nothing has occurred. It means the ground of everything is nothing. Everything is the showing of nothing. Everything shows without becoming something. Somethingness is the conceptualization of there is this and that. This is this because it's not that. They are mutually exclusive. They have some internal definition or personal integrity which repels that which contradicts their own self-completeness. A banana is not an apple. There is no place in the world of the banana for an apple. It is other, mutually exclusive. But Kada, or primordial purity, means there is not even one tiny basis that would give a personal, internal, or self-defining identity to anything. So when we look for our mind, we find thoughts, feelings, sensations, memories. They arise and they pass. They are there. But in their vanishing, they show I'm in the mind. It's as if I'm the mind, but bye-bye, I'm off. Just like the reflection is in the mirror, here I am, and then gone. The mirror can show the reflection because it is empty of self-identity. And this is the same with the mind. This is the meaning of uh, the primordial purity of the mind. 
there is nothing in it that can uh, allow you to define it as this or that. It is ungraspable. Now, if we just go back a little bit and we're talking about um, how this notion of a self arises, I believe in myself, I grasp at myself, I'm here, I can tell you about me, but each thing I say will arise and vanish. Each thing I experience, a sensation, memory, whatever, arises and vanishes. So, unawareness is when we are unaware of our own unborn, unlimited, infinite presence as space. When you are at one with the space, you're just open. But if there is a little vibration which stands you, or a li a, put it, uh, if there is a little vibration that seems to indicate space as an experience, there is the sense of presence as experiencer, and the experiencer is experiencing something so vast, it goes unconscious. This in, in the tradition, this is a description of the first moment of unawareness. As soon as there's a sense of standing in relation to something, and that something is nothing, then it becomes like oblivion and there's a wipeout. And each time there is this uh, unconsciousness, when it uh, clears a little bit, there is uh, the, the beginning nexus of, a, of presence as consciousness. Instead of there being a simple knowing, there is now the beginning of a knower doing the knowing. So maybe in the summer, if you go out in the mountains and you're climbing up the hill, quite tiring, you get to a little quiet place and you sit down, and, oh, and you just see, you're just there. And then some thoughts come in and you start to comment on what you see. And with the manifesting of these different thoughts and feelings and sensations, the initial variation of the display of the hill and the trees and the valley, all as a kind of diversity within the whole, where it was all just this, now it's being divided up into, oh, these are pine trees, oh, my grandmother used to have this wild flower growing near her, and so on. Many thoughts arise. And the more you are able to define what you see, the more it gives a kind of fi fixed form to your own identity. You are somebody who recognizes this tree, but doesn't know what that one's called. The differentiation of the field of experience allows more differentiation within what is taken to be the experiencer. The world requires me to make sense of it. So when the Western people were going to Australia, they didn't see roads or houses. It seemed like it was just a land of potential. Nobody was doing anything really with it. There were many uh, indigenous people traveling around, gathering berries, doing hunting, but they were not establishing some external fixation. So the first thing when, when the British arrived there, they thought we have to establish a settlement. And uh, the settlement means we have to have a pier and then we have to put some buildings there to store what we take off the ships. 
and build houses, a, a good house for the boss and less houses for the ordinary workers. Then gradually, Australia came to look like a proper country. Now we know what we're doing. Now we can make some plans. So they brought in camels. So they could go across the desert and they introduced many, many uh, things to transform the potential into their idea of what was proper. And this offers us a kind of metaphor for thinking about when you're under the power of construction and being busy, the fact, the fact that life is going on without construction doesn't stop you. So the British didn't decide, oh, these woolen uniforms are very hot in the sunshine. We could take them off and live like the Aborigines. And uh, this indicates that although in our lives we get many moments where there is just a freshness or an openness and we have a, a, a sense, oh, I could have a different life. Yet we encounter the power of our habit formations, the need to hold our life together, to maintain our identity, to think about our pension and so on. And so we find ourselves back on the train tracks moving in a fixed direction. So this is a way of thinking about this uh, fetter of duality. Each of us has the sense that we are here, we exist. And we're not just an open potential because inside our ego self identification, I am this specific person. There are some things I like and some things I don't like. For example, the first vegetable shop near me has quite nice vegetables but I don't like the man running the shop so I'm happy to walk further to the next shop which has the same kind of vegetables but I prefer the, the man selling them this has to do with me with my mental formation what I like what I don't like I'm not going into the shop to marry the shopkeeper I just want vegetables. But it matters to me whether I like the man selling them or not. The vegetables are the important thing. But nonetheless, I don't want to give my money to this guy. I don't like how he looks. I don't like, no, I don't want it. In, when you observe yourself as you move in the world in different situations, you see how these momentary colorations or feeling tones arise and take you towards possibilities or away from them. So having the duality of one shopkeeper being better than the other, I am fettered or tied up or imprisoned by the belief that one shopkeeper is somehow better than the other, maybe intrinsically better than the other. So the simple diversity of the possibilities available in this shopping area is restricted by my own beliefs that some shops are uh, more suitable for me than others. It's not the quality of the shopkeeper that is imprisoning me, but my belief that my feelings tell me the truth about the shopkeeper. So it's uh, very important that we observe how we restrict our freedom to participate widely in this open world. As uh, Namkai Norbu, the great Dzogchen teacher, said, don't limit yourself. Don't introduce limitations. They are not in the actual field of experience. Limitations arise when you identify with the energy nexus of the ego self. The ego self has no true existence, but it remains present for us due to activity. It is an illusion. Just as uh, if you take a burning stick from a fire on a dark night and you wave it around your head, you get a circle of fire. 
there is no circle of fire. There is one burning point on the end of the stick going round in a circle, and it seems to create a circle of fire. The circle will exist as long as the movement of your hand continues. You have to hold the stick. So it's the same way. When the energy potential of your hand is formed around the stick and you're turning it, then the circle of light appears. So when the energy potential of your mind tightens around a concept, I exist, and that uh, leads to the activity of the activation of factors, it gives rise to the sense there is an actual self there. The self is the activation of the idea of the self. Our self is an activity. And we are very busy people. So, in climbing the hill and just sitting, oh, wow, there's nothing to be done. There isn't a sign up that says, these trees are lost, lonely orphans. They don't know who they are. Please tell them their proper names. The trees don't need anything from us. But we feel the need to start naming and thinking about and remembering when I was somewhere similar and on and on and on. So, in order to free ourselves from this fetter of duality, we don't need to do anything. We need to do less. To allow these various thoughts and feelings and sensations to arise without merging into them, taking hold of them, building something with them. If you allow whatever is arising to arise, it will go by itself. When the thoughts don't seem to go, it's because we are subtly hanging on to them. We are using them to work out what's going on. We've entered into the development of meaning through narrative. This is uh, relative truth. Relative truth means fictional truth. Just as we can read a novel and enter into the world of the characters, so we enter into samsara, and as we're born in this life into our uh, family, we learn the narrative structures of the family. And then we become gradually competent at storytelling. And our story gets woven into the stories of the family, of the people at school, and so on. And that gives us a sense of identity. So we have a, a slight problem here. I want to be me, and I want to be Buddha. You can't have both. If you become Buddha first, then you can become you again, but a little bit emptied out. When the Buddha manifests, he manifests for the other. If we have the good fortune to meet some of these older lamas, we find that from early morning to night, they're working for the benefit of others. But if we start with our ego self, this means I am for myself. And the self-referential, self-confirming feedback loop of activity cuts us off from our own Buddha nature. And this is our tragedy. In order to maintain my sense of being myself, I willingly put the fetter of duality on. I limit myself in order to free myself. That's a little bit strange. But the freedom of the person moving in the world with friends and enemies, likes and dislikes, is very different from the freedom of the Buddha. So if we want to see that from the very beginning, we have never been bound by the fetter of duality, we have to again and again open to our mind as it actually is, 
and not rely on the busyness of our dualistic consciousness. Good. Okay, let's have a half an hour break and be back at 10 to. Good. See you then. Good morning, happy people. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Okay, so let's begin doing the Guru Yoga again. Ah. So then the text says, so not being dulled by the false friends, encouraging complacency. That could be, uh, it's not necessarily a person who's a friend. You might, you might see an interesting film being advertised that will be uh, on your computer or on television. Oh, I'd like to watch that. It's neither good nor bad if you watch it. The issue is who would be watching the film? If you relax and open, you can watch the film in a state of awareness. But if you're tired or life's difficult, you might want to just kind of abandon yourself into the movie and let it take you away. And that might feel just what you need but it would be a little bit like being stunned or anesthetized. Our lives are short. We don't know what's going to happen. The practice of getting close to your mind as it actually is, is a, a subtle practice. It's not something you can do in a crude way or a distracted way. So all across the world, we can see people being displaced from their homes by floods, by war, by uh, people cutting down the forest. So the conditions which were operating before the turbulence arrived would have been more conducive to uh, finding that subtle door of awakening. But if you... If you miss the chance, then when the turbulence begins, it's very hard. So our orientation is always the middle way, not too tight and not too loose. Once we are in touch with the unborn openness of our own mind, everything is within this. It's then an issue of keeping the integration of whatever is arising within the spaciousness. And at that stage in the practice, uh, turbulence can help you uh, deepen and enrich the quality of your presence. But at first, when we are still habitually locked into our dualistic consciousness, if we want to really relax and open, we need to make good use of whatever supportive factors there are around that help us to relax. It's not about anxious prediction of difficulties which might arise, but staying in touch with your own living profile 
then work with the factors around which are conducive for you to uh, support you in practice. Some people are more alert in the morning, some more in the evening. For some people, it's quite uh, easy to integrate short sitting sequences in the course of the day. For other people, they might need to block off a weekend and have a, a quiet time to allow themselves to connect. There's no fixed recipe that you can learn and then apply because uh, our own condition of sensation in the body, emotions, uh, and being busy with uh, having to think about problems in order to keep your job and so on, these will fluctuate. So this is a very adult practice. Mm. There's no big uh, papa or mama going to tell you what to do. Getting lost is easy. The key thing is to develop and maintain an attitude of kindness towards yourself and everyone else. You want to work with yourself, not against yourself. So then in the next line, he says, I will lovingly befriend the good house of Shunyata. Shunyata is the Sanskrit word for emptiness. It indicates something which is empty or open that you can't, you can't find the edge of it. And so it has no shape. So you want to get to know Shunyata. Like if you met some new person and you would like to have them as a friend, then you, you need to hang out with them and have some free time so you can chat and have a drink and so on. But unfortunately, a lot of the time we are in, if you like, the, the bad house of stuff. We have our possessions. You might have family responsibility of aging parents or children or grandchildren. All of these things are important but they are not doors to awakening. And day after day, month after month, you can spend your time being busy, developing a nice garden or staying friendly with the neighbors. There are always things to do. If you just reflect on all that has occurred since the beginning of this year, how much time were you actually available for the opening that can occur in the practice. Everything will be important if you make it important. It's not about being selfish, but some people would like to chat all day and all, always have some stories to gossip. And then an hour has gone by and two hours have gone by. The, now your head is full of these stories they were telling you. What will you do with them? So, if you're walking in the countryside, there are many beautiful and gentle wild flowers, but there are also nettles. And if you touch the nettle, you get stung. They're, they're not bad, but probably if you don't want to get stung, you a little bit careful. They're also rather beautiful to look at with the very fine little hairs on the leaves and so on. But there's no need to touch them unnecessarily. So with this attitude, who are the people in your life who are time wasters? We are going to die. And we are anyway quite busy. So we don't have much free time. So... Sometimes you have to be quite f firm and straightforward with people. I don't have time to give you. But I thought you liked me. I do like you, but I don't have time to offer you. Both are true. So it's, if you are too soft and you allow yourself to be molded by other people's needs and by the pressure of events and things to do, the space available for your own relaxed open practice may be very small. Because in relative terms, we need to have a bit of space. 
Sialama used to say that in Tibet, the basis of meditation was door closed. Keep the door closed. I, I'm not available. Some people might uh, think that's rude, but their thought that this is rude belongs to them. Leave them their thought. Don't steal it. It's not your thought. Your thought is, I'm doing my practice. So on a relative level, we need time and space to open ourselves up. We're opening ourselves to the intrinsic great openness. And then we see that the ground of everything is empty and ungraspable. And because this is the sole source, the sole basis for everything which is occurring, all occurrences also are inseparable from emptiness. And in that way, uh, we will lovingly befriend the good house of Shunyata. That because we are relaxed and open, we can find ourselves in the open. In English, there is a saying, if you want something done, ask a busy person because they're already quick at mobilizing. So if you want nothing done, you don't want to ask, a, don't ask a busy person. Don't be a busy person. You won't, <laughs> otherwise nothing is very hard. It, uh, it says, uh, if we maintain this uh, understanding of the non-duality of awareness and emptiness, clarity and emptiness, appearance and emptiness, <coughs> which are the aspects of the good house of uh, Shunyata, then with this, the mother actuality and the child will quickly meet. When the child gets anxious, he wants something. You want, maybe you need to pick a baby up and rock it and so on. But when the baby is moving towards sleep, you sing it a lullaby. The tunes of lullabies are usually very soft. In the words are sweet. So when we are kind to ourselves and not judging ourselves and not pushing and striving to get somewhere else, This is like uh, singing a lullaby. Our anxious arousal starts to calm. And then we feel more fresh, more open. We're not preoccupied. And in that way, our open, empty availability and the always present open, empty availability of the mother come together. I am the illusory patterning, inseparable from the clarity of the heart of the Great Mother. This means th that you awaken to your always present integrity with the whole, with the ground. And then you just remain in that state. <laughs> so if we remember these uh, three statements of Garab Dorji, the first is that we uh, open to the open by opening. And we open by being in our openness. As we have looked at several times in this uh, time together, we could not have so many thoughts and feelings and sensations unless the mind was fundamentally empty. Emptiness is not uh, something esoteric or special or far away. You, you meet someone and you're talking, you're relaxed. There's nothing, there's nothing uh, you need to say. The conversation is flowing and the words flow out of you. And their words flow into you. And then you flow back towards them. So like experienced dancers in an improvised pas de deux, the bodies are just moving and sweeping and responding. So to open to the openness of our mind, 
is not to stop the energetic flow of appearances, but to paradoxically to allow them to flow without any impediment. So Garvdotji is saying, you need to be introduced or shown the openness of your mind. This is not something special. Uh, we, there are ritualistic ways of doing this with mirrors and crystals and peacock feathers and so on. But this is to offer a symbol of something. Moment by moment, life is different. Oh, movement in emptiness. This very moment is the manifestation of the energy or the display of emptiness. And it's not manifesting out of emptiness. Otherwise, we've got a subtle uh, polarity of there is emptiness and then there's manifestation of emptiness and they're not the same. As you are sitting just now, whatever is happening for you is happening for you. Some sound is going in your ear. Light is moving in the room according to uh, how your head turns or not. Thoughts, feelings, sensations, moving. If you want to find a stable reference point, it will be a concept. And it will be stable as long as you can keep holding it in mind. And then you will forget it. And something else will be happening. You cannot still the flow of experience. But nor can you make the openness of awareness move. So <clears throat> this good house of shunyata or emptiness is the space within which the radiant sun of your awareness is shining. My mind is empty and full because the experiences that it is full of are always self-dissolving, I can see that it's empty. And yet this experience is always here, so the mind is full. So Garab Dorji is saying, keep the mother and child together. They, on they only appear to be separate when there is unawareness of the inclusive ground. The second point of Garat Dorje is don't think about your experience. <clears throat> don't analyze what is happening. Don't talk to other people about it. Compare it and contrast it with experience of others. If you read these uh, biographies and autobiographies of the great Tibetan yogis, you're likely to feel quite stupid. They had amazing things happen for them. I would like amazing things to happen for me. Why am I not having amazing things? Oh, because there's something wrong with me. I'm a kind of substandard yogi. No, oh, no, this is very bad news. Must try harder. No, 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 no. Remember, the ego is a thief. When you read this uh, autobiography or the, the Namtar, the story of the liberation of Milarepa, Milarepa got Milarepa's experience. Is your name Milarepa? No. So don't take his experience. While you're thinking, oh, if only I could experience what he experienced, you're not being present with your own experience. It doesn't matter how your experience is. It is as it is. As is. Just this. You probably have some qualities other people you know don't have. They will have qualities you don't have. 
we are not made in a factory. We manifest according to our karma, which is a very, very complex repertoire of potential moves. And so you find yourself just this. So don't compare and contrast this with that. Open to this. And if you open again and again to the present moment, you will find that you are precisely where you need to be. Here and now. Just here. So then the, the third point of Garab Dorji is to continue in this way. Free of uh, artificial confidence, free of pride, free of doubt, just with the simplicity it's like this. Some days are easy, some days are not easy. These are flavors of experience. The more you explore the different flavors of experience, staying present with them exactly on the point of their arising, without any effort, you will see them dissolve. They vanish. So they are as they are without offering any basis for feeling, oh, this is going well, or this is going badly. So Garb Dodge says, just continue in this way. This is enough. Then a thought arises, oh, but I would like to have spiritual experiences. Or I would like my body not to have so much pain. The Buddhas don't seem to have pain in their bodies. But well, I've got pain in my body. What does this mean? This means you are lost in thought. So don't get lost in thought. Pain arises and passes. It's dynamic. Energy is moving up and down the nerve pathways. It's not something fixed. This is how it is. If you look at the pantheon of the meditation deities, some are peaceful, some are angry, some are sexy. Each of us has our own character. Some people have very busy sexual lives, some people have very quiet sexual lives. Is one better than the other? If you would have liked to have a very busy sexual life, but you were afraid or embarrassed or believe that no one liked you, then that would be sad. Because you, you would have been trapped inside a neurotic or a, a, a constructed ident identity which limited your capacity to manifest your potential. So you, after some time, you might think, oh, I'm sad that I haven't fulfilled that aspect of my potential. So that's a very uh, beautiful dualistic expression. I am sad that I have not fulfilled this aspect of my potential. Me, my potential, and this bond of sadness. I'm looking at the thought. I'm looking at the reflection. Where's the mirror? I, would, I need to sort out the fucking reflection before I find the mirror. This is wrong. My life shouldn't be this way. Ah, that, then that's very, very sad. So Garab Dordi is saying, ah, ah, whatever pattern life emerges with, stay with the mirror. The reflection is the child. The mirror is the mother. The child will be an orphan without the mother. So again and again, relax into the state of the mirror and allow life to be as it is, working with the particular shaping of how it is for you. Analyzing, judging, trying to improve, trying to uh, make it better, this will not help. You can't uh, buy the mind. You can't lose the mind. 
it just is, it's here. So this is uh, the essential point that for the mother and child to meet, for experience and the ground of experience to be inseparable, then just think of this imagery. Say this child is three years of age. The mother can pick up the child and embrace it. But the child can't really embrace the mother. Its arms aren't big enough. The child wants to be embraced and included. Means allow the emptiness of your mind, which already includes everything, to include, to include whatever is arising now. This moment, this moment, this moment, this moment. Whatever is occurring is within the embrace or the womb or the heart of the Great Mother. And as long as what is arising is non-dual with emptiness, there is nothing better than this. Because then you are completely at home in the non-duality of appearance and emptiness, clarity and emptiness, awareness and emptiness. There is nothing to be improved. But when a thought arises in your mind, this would make my life better. Then you are changing the reflections in the mirror without awakening to the mirror. For the mirror, every reflection is okay. So the basic uh, instruction in the meditation is to relax and open and whatever is arising, stay precisely on that. So if we open and then we hear a dog barking, when the sound of the dog arises, the felt sense is the sound is there and we are there with the sound. But if you conceptualize, no, but I'm sitting here and I hear the dog and it's outside and it must be oh, quite far away because of the volume, then you're just off in the turbulence of conceptualization. Stay with what is arising in the moment of its arising, at the site of its arising. When we say the source is empty, it's not a thing. It means you can't locate it. It's not in a place. If you're sitting outside and you hear and it's a plane in the sky, you can explain that the light is coming from the sun reflected off the shape of the plane and coming into your eye. Therefore, you can see the plane. But if you keep your mind relaxed, naked, fresh, uncontrived. Your mind is where the plane is. The plane is in the mind. Everything is in the mind. The ego self is in the mind. But when you imagine that your mind is in your ego self and that you're located here inside your body, then everything becomes relative because you're looking at if it's near or far, a friend to me or a danger to me, here, now, why would I not be here and now? Where else will I be? Can I go to yesterday or this morning or an hour ago or even one second ago? It's gone. Can I go to tomorrow? It's not there. One minute from now, we don't know. The only place I ever am is here and now. Everything else is dualistic conceptual imagining. <clears throat> so here and now, if there is nowhere else and no other time, then this is where everything is. I'm living in the party place, in the party time. Everything's happening here. This is it. 
and it's fresh and direct. Everything else is an idea about an idea about an idea. And where are these ideas? Here and now. So I'm here and I want to see what's here. So I'm going to cover my eyes. Oh, I don't see so much. Oh, why would I cover my eyes to see more? Why would I think about things in order to find out how they are? They are already self-displaying, self-showing. Aha, this means I am the queen or the king. Here and now is the name of my throne. I sit on my throne. And around me, in this magical mandala palace, there are singers and dancers, torturers and undertakers, because this mandala is sometimes peaceful, sometimes wrathful, but it's always here. Everything which occurs is here. So if I remember these three aspects, the essence of the mind is open and empty. The quality of the mind is immediate radiance, uh, showing everything in ungraspable clarity. And within this, there is the relational flow of kindness, which finds the precise proximity to each moment. So the essence, the first aspect is always on the throne. Around the throne is the mandala of the clarity, the illumination of all the potential. And the kindness, which is all pervading, is the movement of the aspects of the mandala inseparable from the heart of the queen, which is always in instant contact. Okay. We'll come back. That's okay. We'll come back to, to this idea. But the, the important thing is the queen needs to stay on the throne and not get off the throne because the throne has a perfect feng shui. It's exactly on the point of the emergence of life, of energy, and the energy moves around it. The, the queen is still. She doesn't move. <laughs> and within the mandala there is movement and they are inseparable so in the practice we sit relaxed and open not chasing after past thoughts not waiting expectantly for future thoughts whatever comes comes whatever goes goes just this and again, paradoxically, the acceptance of just this provides or opens the way to the infinite balance or equanimity or evenness. Oh, in, in Tibetan, <coughs> excuse me, in Tibetan they call it nyamja. Nyam means even or equal or without uh, conflictual differentiation. If you're standing and you are truly vertical, so your weight is running through your skeleton, you don't need to have tension in your muscles. But if you move slightly off balance, then your, some of your muscles will start to tense up in order to prevent you falling over. So you want to find the line of gravity going down through you, then the body really relaxes. In a similar way with the mind, we want our presence to be fully aligned with here and now. Not to the front, into the future, not to the back, into the past. Just on this point, on this point. So this is the, the heart of the meditation practice. There are many texts available now in uh, non-Asian languages which point to how the mind is and what the, how to go about doing the practice. But they all agree that 
to be aligned on the point is the most important thing. Because if you are attentive to proprioception and the uh, nature of sensation in your body, and your body is completely aligned, nothing really to judge or review or think about. You're just there. <coughs> but as soon as you're leaning a bit off balance, you start to feel some pressure in your neck, in this uh, tilts the spine, which brings some adjustment around the uh, pelvis. There is something to be done because there is where I should be and where I am. And this gap is duality. So now I need to adjust myself. So in the text, uh, it says, uh, Macha Tetra Lama Chikiku, the, the Dharmakaya Guru is uncontrived and free of artifice. There's nothing to be corrected. The Dharmakaya is always just here, just now, open this. Dualistic consciousness is not like that. Consciousness is a constructor, shaping forming, building pictures, judging. This work is necessary in samsara because we are off balance. So you often hear parents saying to the child, what do you want to do tomorrow? What, what is tomorrow? You can't find tomorrow. It's an abstract concept. So then the child imagines into it, oh, tomorrow I'm going to ride my bicycle. But we don't know. Much better to, to say, what shall we do now? Or even, what are you available for doing now? Or even, what would have to change for you to be available to tidy your bedroom? Hmm. Because when you're in the mood, tidying the bedroom is quite easy. But I don't want to do it. It's fine the way it is. You have a problem with my bedroom because you are called mother. And that's what mothers are, people who have problems with their children's bedrooms. But I, darling, I'm just trying to make life easier for you. There's no end to this desire to adjust each other into the way we want them to be. So when we have the time and the opportunity, relax and release, be present in this moment, and whatever happens, try to gently bring yourself back onto this cross of here and now, here and now. Being, if again, if we use the physical example, if you're standing grounded, you have the greatest opportunity to move freely in any direction. Because of course, when you are grounded, and centered, you're not having to focus into internal sensation. Yeah, you're not, uh, you're not focused on internal sensations of muscular tension and so on. Relaxed, open through the senses. And if there is movement in the field, you can respond. When you have anxiety or tension, this creates a particular patterning of the muscles being ready for action. But that may not be what is required. Oh. We want the muscles uh, healthy and strong and the joints easy and to be relaxed and available. Then we, mob we can mobilize as required. Compassion is for the other the more satisfied or at peace or contented we are, we don't need to use our energy to fulfill our ego longings. And therefore, we're aware of the field and we participate in the field, not with a plan, not with a map, but with an immediate attention to the manifesting 
topology of the phenomena. Okay, so we take a break now for uh, half an hour and back at 10 to for the last session. So good, have a nice break. Bye. Okay. Good. So now we're coming to the very last uh, part of this uh, short text. And it says, from the time in which the mother and the child meet, I will act with all my power for the benefit of sentient beings. So oh, how can we benefit all beings? For example, if you go to the seaside and the waves are coming up and down, if you touch one wave, which seems to have somehow its own shape, you just touch one wave. And yet the water in that wave is not different from the water in all the other waves and not different from all the water in the great ocean. As long as we see sentient beings as being unique individuals with their own personal existence, then clearly we can help very few people. There are too many. But if you see that each person is the radiance of the unborn ground, and each of these manifestations has no true difference from or apartness from the other ones, then in touching one, you touch all. This is a little bit similar to the passage in the Bible when Jesus says, Inasmuch as you do an act of kindness to the least of these people, the least of my followers, you do it to me. Because generally religions are concerned with inclusivity. Due to dogma and sectarianism, this is often obscured. But God is the father of everyone, and in particular the father of Jesus. Jesus says, uh, no one comes to the Father except through me. So, I mean, you could teach Dzogchen through the Bible. It's not very different. Because the Son manifests from the Father. And if you want to find your mind, you have to stay with your thoughts. If you think that you can empty out your thoughts and awaken, you are mistaken. The mind without thoughts, feelings, and sensations is a pretty stupid mind. Thoughts, feelings, and sensations are not the problem. The problem is not recognizing that they are the radiance of the mind. So if you think all children are the children of God, and God is immortal and invisible, then the true nature of his children is also immortal and invisible. Oh. All religions are saying you're not who you think you are. It means you have to look. You have to open your heart and trust. But, of course, terms like God tend to be uh, a bit abstract and far away. In the number of people who go to churches to pray is uh, much more than the people who contemplate uh, their mind in silence in the Christian tradition. So it's important to see that uh, the view can be quite deep and important, but you need to have the method that allows the view to manifest. So when we look around and we see birds and cats and dogs and people and cows, whatever we kind of living forms we see, we have uh, different ways of uh, attributing identity and status to them. Someone might look at a cow and think, oh, a lot of steak. Someone else 
is looking and thinking, oh, this poor creature is trapped in a field. They never get out except when they go to the abattoir. And if we have been studying the general Mahayana view of Buddhism, we might think, oh, this cow was once my own mother. And when she was my mother, she did so many things for me. I owe her a debt of gratitude. This cow is not something inferior to me. This cow is the living presence of my mother in a past life who did so much for me. And although this is a, a dualistic view, it's uh, very important because it's a way of rebalancing prejudice. The way animals are treated in modern farming is atrocious. A few years ago, I went to a little retreat outside Barcelona. We were driving over some gentle rolling hills with the windows open. And suddenly there was a terrible smell. We were driving past these long buildings with no windows. These were the houses where they keep the hens. And the smell of the shit is unbelievable. These creatures are living in these cramped conditions with, with the beak cut off so they don't peck each other. They have no significance except as a means to an end, as a method of generating a profit for the farmer. The chicken has a life, it has sensitivity, it's interested. When you see them walking around, if they're outside in a field, they're pecking and checking you out. They have qualities which are made invisible when they're packed into these terrible houses. And if we hold in mind it, this idea that they have been our mothers in a previous life, then this is something terrible. The idea that we have mastery over all creatures and it's up to us what we do with them is terrible. We know what happened a hundred years ago to the whales, how they were captured and boiled down for oil and the rest thrown into the sea. So we might believe, oh, they're just animals. So the Mahayana belief, it says, oi, they have been your mother. Show, show your mother, sorry, show your mother some respect. So these kind of concepts are like a wedge which we drive into our assumptions to open up some space to actually see a living creature. So when we have the intention that we will help all beings, this is a huge, huge task. What else will I do with my time? Uh, I should make money. Then I will have a better life. And what will I do with my better life? I'll protect myself so that I won't need to be made aware of the suffering that my happiness brings to others. In many countries, the wealthy people live in uh, gated communities with sometimes armed guards, like in some African countries. So if somebody is poor, and they would like a little share of the money that the very rich people have, then it's very important for the rich people to be clear about the definition they have of the poor people. These people are poor because of their own bad ideas. They are thieves and terrorists. And if they come over the wall, I want the guard to shoot them. Because if, if I was to share what I had with them, they would get a lot and I would get less. Why would I do that? You think I'm stupid. Look at these people. Some of them, they don't have shoes. They have no education. You want to say they, they have the same value as me? Generally speaking, across the world, this is the basic uh, template or calculus for allocating value to people. 
So, the Mahayana view, I will work for the benefit of all beings, however they are, whatever current qualities they have. For these outer reasons, like they have been my mother in a past life, but more precisely because they, they have no internal existence that makes them different from anyone else. They are empty formations. And the empty ground manifests these particular forms. I am directly related to them through my emptiness. As if there was a big field, and in the field there were many flowers, many kinds of grass, and so on. Many, many things are growing. These are all, if you like, these are all the, the children of the earth. So in the same way, in, uh, from the Dzogchen view, the ground or the basis is emptiness. Everything arises from emptiness. The field of emptiness, the arena of emptiness is undivided. So again, if you look at the sea and you see the waves going up and down, you could have a competition to see who can catch the best wave. Maybe you give them a lot of money as a prize. The waves arise and go back into the sea. When the wave arises, it doesn't come out of the sea. Although we all we say wave, wave is a form of sea. It, in the same way, each of us is like a wave of the ground, manifesting, but without separating from the ground, having no individual identity. And with that, what, what it will be the true basis of my difference from you? The structure that makes me different from you is attachment to the self. Because what about me? Me first. Let me deal with what I need, and if there is something left, I give it to you. Because I'm the main one. But the number one what? Number one form of emptiness? The best wave in the ocean? the best cloud in the sky, the best reflection in the mirror. The diversity of appearance is inseparable from the emptiness of the ground. And this is very important because although when we study karma, we see that uh, our life situation arises as a uh, ripening or fruition of the causes we establish when we uh, make an action with a limited intention. So, for this, the basis of karma is always duality because it's centered in an intentional form, uh, the formation of an intention which leads to an action. For example, I meet you. I, I seem to like you. I want you to like me. So that's the, the first step of the karma. I am real, you are real, I like you, and I want you to like me. So the second stage is uh, the movement of bringing that uh, intention to uh, fruition is I have to set up a setting in which I do something for you. So I take you to a nice restaurant and I buy you a nice meal. And I speak sweetly and we become more friendly. At the end of the evening, we say goodbye and I review how it's gone. I think, oh, that's good. I'm glad I have a new friend. So intention, sorry, uh, duality, to intention, to enactment, and to review. And that alignment of the energy creates a kind of current or a flow which remains embedded in my mental stream, 
and can manifest later at some time. And the same structure would operate if I decided on the basis of duality that I want to rob you and then I steal from you and then I'm happy that I've stolen from you. Then I have to experience the consequence of this action. Maybe a long time later, when I have completely forgotten the causal conditions which gave rise to that tendency. So that there we have the teaching on cause and effect. <clears throat> and sometimes that uh, theory, if you like, is used to justify the bad treatment of other people. If people are poor because of the ripening of their karma, and uh, I shouldn't interfere with this great cosmic system. When they have purified these causal factors, then their lives will be happy. But uh, that's a perverse view. <clears throat> Rather, we should apply the theory of karma to ourselves. I will help all beings because what else would I do? Everything that arises for me is here and now. This mandala of here and now is the Dharma Datu, the, the space within which all phenomena manifest. <clears throat> as soon as I think of someone, they are in my mind. So I could say, may all my friends be happy. That's enough. Oh, and so only my friends are inside this situation. Oh, may all Scottish people be happy. Maybe even all British people be happy. All European people be happy. All human beings be happy. All human beings plus dogs and cats and fish and more and more and more. Why not? Why not say hello to everyone? <clears throat> Fish have minds. Birds have minds. All the different creatures have a mind. That is to say, they have a sensitivity and experience. And they like some things and don't like other things. When I lived in Darjeeling in India, they had, there were many, many leeches and they would go into my shoes and when I took the shoe off, there are all these creatures drinking my blood. Friend or enemy. In 200 years ago in Europe, uh, doctors would put leeches onto the body to take out the bad blood and that would purify the sick person. Unfortunately, the leeches in Darjeeling, they just wanted the good blood. So I tried to get them, come off, go away. They, they don't really like conversation. Then what to do? Some people say put some salt on them, but uh, that affects the porosity of their skin and they can die from that. Or they should uh, take a, some hot thing like a some incense or a cigarette and hold it close and then they'll, they don't like the heat so they fall off. They want to live. Your body is a way of getting food and nutrition. I don't like it. But they like it. Should I give them some of my blood? How much? So this is Ethics floating in the sky is easy, but when you're in your body and you're having to decide, shall I let the mosquitoes feed off my arm or not? The mosquito wants blood. My blood. It is my enemy. Or it is hungry. <clears throat> again and again, in the realm of relative truth, we see that each situation, as soon as you reify it, as soon as you say, this is a mosquito and it wants to take my blood, 
then we we get embroiled in all kind of thinking what should i do how much should i give what is right what is wrong so generally we we need to hold two things together one is the infinite generosity of a deeply heartfelt feeling may all sentient beings be happy and at the same time you have the limited resources of your body and also the fact that we have our ego self which is not yet uh, dissolved so near uh, Kathmandu in Nepal uh, there is a used to be a very small shrine of a place called uh, Tamoluchen in the the name of the place means um, giving the body to the tigress and it's described in these uh, stories of the buddha's previous lives that once when he was a wandering mendicant he came upon a tigress that had many small pups babies and she was very tired a lot of babies and maybe a difficult birth and if the mother dies then all the babies will die so he decides he should feed the tigress and he puts out his finger for the tigress to eat but she is too weak so he gets a softer part of his arm and he puts it in the mouth of the tigress but again she's too weak she can't bite through the skin so he takes a sharp stone and he cuts it up and down on his arm until the blood is flowing and he puts this in the mouth of the tigress and gradually she manages just to lick the blood and she becomes stronger strong enough to start chewing on his arm and then she eats all of him and feeds her babies that might be a little bit too uh, difficult for us because we have our self referential attitude so again we have to remember working with circumstances making a grand heroic gesture and then regretting it is not very useful you have to be honest and clear about your lived capacity that is to say the view or your aspiration is to help all beings but given your current location in this body that you are attached to the uh, range of activity that you can offer is going to be much less than your view but in the mahayana view they have many ways of strengthening whatever we can manage so we should begin every practice with <clears throat> taking the bodhisattva vow i will do this work for the benefit of others and while we're doing the practice we should include all beings in the benefits of the practice and at the end of the practice we should dedicate the merit for all beings we are not doing a, a very ritualistic kind of practice so we don't recite some uh, formulaic verses making these uh, statements but we keep them close to us we doing this for the benefit of all and especially from the seven branch practice we rejoice in the merit of others so when we hear of of the, this jataka story of the buddha in a previous life offering his body we can rejoice in the merit how wonderful how amazing to be able to do that for the benefit of others this is a beautiful thing to do it makes our heart warm how wonderful you could do that but it's also a protection against comparing and contrasting oh the buddha could do these things i can't do these things the buddha is inferior i'm a small lost sentient being this kind of definition or judgment on ourselves or on other people is very unhelpful the infinite mind becomes more 
available, more open to us, the more we open by experiencing our own infinity. So then he says, I will perform the deeds of a bodhisattva. I will think about what will be beneficial for others. So when you go out for a walk and you see people, maybe you see a mother with four children taking them to school. And one of the children is walking very slowly, so they're all going to be late. So you can say, may this mother be blessed with four good, kind, compliant children. Because you can see, life would be easier for the mother if the children fitted in together, and also for the child that's going last and getting negative attention. It's not about um, reciting formula. May all beings be happy. Yeah, that's, that opens us up. But what does this person need? You can look at their face, their expression, their postures, their gestures. Some people look very anxious. Some people look very lonely and shy and frightened. Some people look... Uh, angry and aggressive. So in each case, we can just formulate a, a gift of a good intention. May your heart be peaceful. May you find friendship and inclusion. So in the tradition, they say, the Buddha Shakyamuni taught 84,000 different uh, dharmas or dharma practices. And if you read through the sutras, you see that he gives different kinds of teaching to different kinds of people. He didn't say to the people who came to see him, you have to conform with my system. More he's saying, how can I present the Dharma to you in a way that will allow you to awaken to how you really are? So, Tibetans have this term, gangla gangdu, which means... We do whatever is necessary to support and educate this particular being. It means I will be flexible. I will use my intelligence, my creativity, my responsivity to find the optimal fit with you to make uh, the entry into Dharma easier. And this is, is very important because we don't want to arrive at a kind of point of complacency. I've done my best. I've done what can be done. Our focus is non-duality. You are part of my world. Or I am part of your world. Or we're co-creating this moment of joint experience. How can I move to have contact with you? This requires a, an intuitive responsivity. But in terms of the dynamic of power, first I receive you, and secondly I respond. This is not the position of the master or the expert. The master knows what to do. From this position, we relax and open and we allow the response to arise in the midst, on the midpoint of the co-emergence of self and other. So there is no limit to the deeds of a bodhisattva. We will do whatever is necessary. So there are many classifications of this. For example, in the tantric tradition, they talk of the four activities. The first is pacifying. May all disease be cured. May all suffering end. May all hostility be pacified. So we're saying, may there be a mood of calmness in the world so that all agitation goes down. Secondly, there is increasing. May all sentient beings be healthy and happy. May the crops grow well so that all can be fed. May there be free and easy access to education. May the girls in Afghanistan be able to go to school. 
may they be, be freed from the prison of patriarchy so that their lives can expand and blossom. Then the third position is uh, overawing or magnetizing. And this is uh, more directly relational in which you bring up your life energy, your whatever you say, your chi, your ki, your charisma, so that you have uh, an impactful presence. And this vital manifestation makes other people stop in their tracks. This interrupts how they might behave. So in a famous uh, Buddhist story, there was a, a murderer called Angulimala. And he wore a necklace of hands around his neck. He would kill people and chop their hands off. So he had garlands of hands. And he needed just, he needed just one more. So he's looking for someone to kill. And the Buddha's walking towards him. Now, usually when people see Angulimala is covered in this blood and his rotting hands are stinking, so they, oh, God. And the Buddha just looking at him, just smiling. Hello. <laughs> Angulimala doesn't meet people who just say, hello. The Buddha's not saying, I'm better than you, but he's also saying, hmm? But he's also showing, I'm not afraid of you. You're a sentient being. I'm here. And this wakens up Angulimala. And this allows him a space in which he can see that there are other possibilities for life. Around the dictators in the world, there are always uh, psychophants. Psychophant means uh, arse licker. Because there are all these people who say, yes, you are right. You are the one who knows. We would never say no to you. You are the big one. And the Buddha doesn't enter into this drama of power. Here is a mind. The mind has energy. The energy is manifesting in this form. I'm here. Then the fourth activity is destruction. Destruction means doesn't doesn't mean killing the person. It mind, it means very powerfully undermining the trajectory of the negative activity. So in the tantric tradition, we have these very wrathful deities, and they manifest a form which is very scary. I'm not frightened of you, but I'll make you frightened of me. You think you're crazy? Come, come close to me. Mm. Then they can breathe out some foul breath and the claws on their fingers become very big and they start to roar. Hulo, 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 hulo. <laughs> Fucking hell, man. No. Because all these dictators are basically cowards. They're like a balloon. Everyone around is pumping them up to make them look very big. So the wrathful Buddhas, they have a little pin and they let the air out. Then he says, I will create a great wave of virtue for the benefit of others. So probably in our lives, we've done some negative things. We might have uh, been selfish or exploited other people or betrayed them. And we know what that feeling is like. It makes us a bit small, a bit anxious. We don't want other people to know. We have secrets. We have to hide our secrets. It's a lot of work. The great advantage of virtue is you don't need to shout it out to other people, but you don't need to hide it either. Living a virtuous life with kindness and thoughtfulness, doing what you can, but always keeping this big, inclusive attitude to all beings. This creates a mood in which uh, 
contact with other people becomes much easier. It's a very simple transaction. You're relaxed, open and available. You're not frightened by the sad stories of other people or overwhelmed by their misery. So you're available. <clears throat> and then lastly, he says, I will gain the effective power to upturn and empty samsara. So on an outer level, samsara is a kind of place or a series of places, the god realms, jealous gods, humans, animals, hungry ghosts, hell realms. And you go into samsara and you wander in samsara. But the more we open into the meditation practice, and the more, mm -hmm. on you go. And the more we attend to the way in which other beings have a different flavor of their life experience, we start to see that samsara, <coughs> excuse me, samsara is describing a quality of participation. As long as we are in the duality of subject and object, self and other, we, look, we will be in this reactivity. They do this to me, I do that to them. And I'm concerned with my own benefit. But by merging our mind with the mind of the Buddha through awakening the Dzogchen view, we remain open in the various invitations and provocations that come from events, don't hook us. We cease being reactive to provocations. And when somebody behaves in a way which is provocative, we have the space to see the energy forces that cause them to do that. Which means I don't get pulled into their dualistic structure. And when we sit in our, med <coughs> in our meditation practice, many uh, experiences are arising and passing. We let them come and go. Every time we uh, merge into a thought or a feeling or a sensation, we are given a little ticket for five minutes more in samsara. And so at the end of your meditation, oh, I've just earned another 10 hours in samsara. And the great thing is, even when I'm not meditating, I'm getting these tickets. So the way not to do that is to stay on your throne, relaxed and open, responding as required. And then you see samsara is empty. There is not one manifestation one phenomena, one form of sentient being, which has its own inherent existence. And then you see, there are no sentient beings to be liberated. The actual situation of all sentient beings is that they are inseparable from the pure ground of the heart of all the Buddhas. But they don't recognize that. And so we feel this sadness for them. Sadness in the manner of a dream. They are dreaming that they are in prison. And because their dream is deep and strong, that is their lived experience. But we are not in that situation. Uh, I remember Chattaro Rinpoche telling me that uh, we between the teacher and the student, it's like two brothers in bed together. One brother is asleep, caught up in a nightmare, and the other brother is awake. And so the brother who is awake tries to awaken the one who is lost in the nightmare. The fact is, both of them are safe in a warm bed. But as long as you are caught up in your nightmare, you can't see that. So although there are no beings to be liberated from samsara, we vow to act for the benefit of all beings and empty samsara. So that is the end of our text, the end of our time. 
we have another weekend meeting, which will be on the six bardos. Again, it's a short text, but very, very beautiful and uh, helpful. There are a lot of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Dharma teachings available, but only you can do your Dharma practice. Not too hard, not too soft. Don't force yourself, become a friend to yourself. So, uh, I want to thank our translators today, uh, Kati, Maria, uh, Bartek, and Milton, and also uh, to Milton for uh, keeping the uh, recording project online. And hopefully these uh, recordings will become available on the website uh, soon. So I wish you happiness in your practice and perhaps we'll meet again. Oh, bye bye. Bye bye time. Bye bye bye. 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 Bye bye.